are live again. We are back on Talking Tennis to bring you Ben Shelton against Tommy Paul, uh, which I have live on a screen in front of me already. And we are already at one game to love to the American. And of course, you're wondering, which American, John? There are two Americans involved. Well, Ben Shelton has held serve in the first game. So he is leading one game to love over Tommy Paul. Let me know your thoughts on, on this match in the live chat. Uh, let me know if you're excited about this. Are you pumped for Shelton? Are you hyped for Paul? Uh, I may be joined by Vanch. I have just sent him a link as well on Twitter. So we'll see if he is able to join us. Um, I will send, I think I can join for Tommy Paul. Yep, cool. So hopefully Vanch will be with us. Uh, I will just confirm or deny that very shortly. But listen, uh, who have you got winning this one, by the way? Who have you got winning this one? Ben Shelton or Tommy Paul? Uh, also hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe to us if you are new to the channel. And uh, it is, by the way, 15 love on the Tommy Paul uh, serve. I think I'm going to post on YouTube a poll as well for this particular match. So that way I can hear and see and think about your thoughts as to where you see it going. I have Tommy Paul winning, but to be honest with you, <laughs> it could go either way. It, it really could. Uh, I don't see this as being an easy win for either player. Uh, let's start that poll. Who's winning today? By the way, did you see them, any of the matches from earlier? Sabalenka winning in straight sets. So she is in her fourth Grand Slam semi-final. Uh, and also Magda Lynette is in her first after she won her match earlier today. Uh, so here's the poll. Let's post it on YouTube. YouTube, who's winning? Uh, Tommy Paul or Ben Shelton? Get voting, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and let me know. We'll come back to that at some point uh, during uh, the first set. So, uh, yeah, so let me know who you think is going to win. Also, let me know in the live chat as well. You can do that too. Who's winning today, Tommy Paul or Ben Shelton? Uh, oh, we already have a couple of comments there. Dee, nice to see you there. I can see Vanch as well joining us. Vanch, is that a jacket you're wearing? Yeah, it's quite a chilly day. It's in San Diego today, actually. Very cold outside. Cool. Well, cool in temperature, but maybe not in thought. Uh, we are one game to love, by the way, with Ben Shelton. It's 30 all. Uh, Vanch may be ahead of me on his stream. I, I guess you're getting the ESPN feed, right? Yep, ESPN. Cool. Uh, what are your thoughts on today's match? I, I I have absolutely no idea. This could result, any result could appear and it wouldn't necessarily be a surprise. I've gone for Tommy Paul. I've gone for the experience, if you like, over the inexperience, but but not with any great conviction. Yeah, it's a pretty hard, a difficult one to call, especially um, lately, you know, experience has been triumphing over youth, I guess. Uh, we saw that with Rublev taking out Rune. Yeah. Uh, and what was a pretty, pretty tough to call match as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I've decided to go bold and go on with Shelton just because I think he's playing with zero baggage right now, like absolutely none. And he's just enjoying life. You know, this is his first time in his life where he can really, well, not really the first, but, you know, one of the very few times where he's just in the honeymoon phase and he can just lap it all up and he's got such a big game. Um, I love his serve and his the combination, uh, just the swagger with which he plays with. It's a very, like, swashbuckling style of tennis. Indeed. And it's, it's powerful and it's, uh, it's doing, clearly doing damage, both his first and his second serve and his first ball after the serve. So... I'm curious to see, and I really like uh, watching Tommy Paul as well. I find him to be very... Uh, me too. Me too. Uh, Damien is creative. less excited by Tommy Paul. But uh, by the way, if it looks like I'm moving around the apartment, I am. I've got a bowl of pasta uh, that is boiling or a saucepan of pasta, so I don't want that to boil over. But yeah, um, I am excited, and I am excited by Tommy Paul. Uh, Shelton, though, by the way, you say it's a first or a match of first. It's also his first time out of the country. Yeah, that, that, is, that is extraordinary. That is his first time ever... Outside the U.S. and he's in the U.S. Australian Open quarterfinals. What do you know about his background? Because I'm I'm guessing if it's the first time outside of the country, he's maybe not coming from the same level of of wealth as perhaps other players. Yeah, I mean, I think he's he's had a lot of great resources, especially through his dad. Okay. Um, and especially playing for playing uh, for the Florida Gators, and he was the NCAA champion. And I think all that challenger success last year had to have given him a lot of confidence, winning those three titles back to back to back to finish off the season and crack the top 100. 
Um, he essentially got his got a wild card into this tournament, but he also got there on his own merit because by the time the Australian Open started, he was firmly inside the top hundred. So, I went not big. That's not not the truth. But I thought he would have a decent U.S. Open on the back of his performances before that tournament. And I thought he might prove a bit problematic. I think they, he might have been on course to meet Medvedev in the third round. Um, uh, it was in the second or third round. I thought, oh, that could be an interesting match for Medvedev. Might cause him one or two problems. And in the end, he goes out in the first round there. As a result, I kind of ignored him regarding the Australian Open. And look where he is. Yeah, and he's also um, in a great side of the draw, like with, uh, with Fritz going out. Um, it was really... It was really sort of uh, just playing with the house money because he say, had to save a match point in his first round, if I'm not wrong, against Zeng. Oh, did he? Uh, in, a, in, a, in the fifth set there. And he won that in the fifth set super tie break. So, oh, okay. Who was that against, sorry? It was against Zizank. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, I probably had him going. I think I had him going out in that round, in that match. Yeah, I think I had him getting to the third round and then losing to Fritz. Oh, okay. By the way, um, you were quite big on on Vekic before this tournament. Did you have her get into the quarterfinals? Yeah, I did. I just felt like she she had uh, shown something to me last year in San Diego. I had watched her play against Danielle Collins in the semifinal there, and she beat tons of great players in that tournament, like Sakari and Sabalenka. And, uh, you know, she was being coached by Pam Shriver as well. Um, and Pam Shriver spoke really highly about her uh, and her potential. And obviously, she had been to quarterfinals of majors before, and been top 20 so i always felt like she's one of those players that you know maybe slightly has underachieved so far in her career so i thought this would be a good opportunity for her and i was very impressed when she took out samsonova 6-3-6-0 that was quite a really big result and then backing yes up that wins. was the one that stood out um did you see her match today with sabalenka yeah i saw i saw some of the second set as i was coming back from work and uh, sabalenka is just absolutely on a tear just playing with so much freedom and confidence right now, and all the in the second the set, goals, yeah, it wasn't quite the same in the first though. Yeah, I, I actually I think that match was a lot closer than what the score indicates. Yeah, it was the first of, set. The first set was breaks galore, and I think right. it wasn't until four three in the first set, and then Sabalenka puts the afterburners on and, and leaves Vekic behind. Yep, and it's amazing. She she had nine double faults, and you know, still only lost five games. <laughs> yeah, but that was also partly because Vekic suddenly got a bit of the double faults vi vi yips, if you like, and she ended up double faulting. Yeah, that's right. I think she double faulted eight times in the first two service games, something like that. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of double, and she ends up with about 12 at the end, which is still not yeah. ideal. But um, mm -hmm. it was early part of the match where she was, I mean, they were just both breaking serve a lot. I don't necessarily yeah. think the quality was that bad. Sometimes when you see lots of breaks of serve, it's because because perhaps the level is not great for either side. But I think, um, listen, Sabalenka's now into her fourth Grand Slam semifinal with a huge, huge chance of making the final. I mean, this time it's not, it's not Pliskova Wimbledon. It's not, um, it's not Fernandez on a, on a, on a charge, if you like, as she was at the U S open. It's not Svantec, who was definitely on a charge in New York last year. It's Magda Lynette. No disrespect. By the way, they're on, on serve here, Tommy Paul, uh, against uh, Shelton. If anything dramatic happens, I'll let you know. But there's a huge chance now for Sabalenka to make her first Grand Slam final, right? Yeah, by far. I mean, I, I was so big on her. I had her winning this title. Me too. I, yeah. just, I was just very impressed when she won the title in Adelaide. Yeah. And beat four really good players and didn't drop a set. And had, had her ups and downs as well in some tight sets there. Um, came back from 5-1 down in one of the matches. But uh, she's just looked... So relaxed also. She doesn't look like she's... I've never seen her this composed mentally for such a long period of time. And she's not having those dips like she used to in matches where she'd play 15 minutes of the most spellbinding tennis and then sort of go off the rails for another 20 or 30 minutes and then yeah. maybe sometimes find her way or sometimes not. So I think she's in a really good headspace. I agree. Um, listen, we're on serve at the moment. Shelton Paul, I just had a quick look at uh, Vekic there backstage. She looks a bit um, down, as you would imagine. What have you made of the tournament so far, both men's and women's? Yeah, I, I mean, it's certainly a strange one with the top two seeds going out on both the uh, men's and women's side. That hasn't happened in any major in the Open era. Of course, right, that's a little yeah. bit wonky with the um, you know Wimbledon not having points, so the rankings are a little bit, you know, not not quite what they should be. Yeah. But uh, but regardless, I thought it was uh, 
you know, some fantastic tournaments for some other, for the Americans. Uh, that That's yeah. one thing that will... But not Taylor play. Fritz. But, but not Taylor Fritz and not Francis either. So I think those two were, you know, maybe slightly, dis maybe definitely disappointed uh, on the basis of our expectations. But then we have so many other great Americans doing well. And then I think it's just, you know, Djokovic and his hamstring. And then the incredible performance that he played against, put up against Diminor. And then obviously um, on the women's side, the main story is the big servers and flat hitters doing really well on these courts, particularly your Rabakinas of the world and your Ostapenkos and players who sort of tasted Grand Slam glory before, but are now some, kind of having a mini resurgence. So um, yeah, and then also challenging times for Fiontech, try, who said that she definitely felt the pressure, didn't play her best tennis against Rabakina. Yeah, I heard that, yeah. That uh, was was outclassed, particularly on the serve and the return. So, I mean, I do think Rebecca is showing a lot of consistency now. I know she went out early on in New York. Was it the first round in New York as well? Yeah. Um, that was a, an, a result that went under the radar for me, at least. Um, mm -hmm. But but I saw her beat Daniel Collins, and I thought, mm -hmm. hang on a second. She is going to pose a, a, a big threat to Sviontek. I, I didn't have Rebecca getting this far, that's for sure at the beginning of the tournament. But then when you sort of reevaluate mid-tournament, and I was given that chance, I think it was on Saturday, I was talking to Jack uh, on on the line on his uh, channel. And mm -hmm. he said, who have you got, Vibacana or Siontek? And I said, I'm going I'm going Vibacana. Um, yeah. I just saw the way she, dis not dismantled, that's not the right word, but the way she beat Daniel Collins. And it, it never, what was funny about that match is it never felt in doubt. It went three sets, but it always felt like, this is Rabakina's here. Maybe yeah. Collins was slightly hindered with with the movement in terms of her knee. I'm not so sure, but um, but listen, it just felt like here we go. Here's Rabakina, and I just thought with with Sviontex in her third round match against Buxa, it was very difficult to tell Sviontex's level at that point because she won yeah. it so easily, six love six one. Yeah, I had I had a similar thought process. I didn't actually have Rabakina getting to the fourth round. I had Daniel Collins beating her. Yeah, um, me too. At the pre pre tournament, yeah. Yeah, uh, and then I was really impressed when she beat Collins, especially after she lost that second set. Really kind of rebounded and put that aside and played supremely well. Even if Collins was fit, I'm not sure she could have done much. And then it was just... Uh, and then also to back it up against Ostapenko yesterday, just very, very impressive mentally. Did you see Holger Runa Rublev? I did. That was a very strange match. I mean... <laughs> You know, I can't say definitely not the highest quality. No, but it was uh, it was very kind of. It reminded me a lot of Alcaraz versus Berrettini in some ways last year. Yep. Where yep. I felt like um, you know, the more complete player didn't end up winning, but and mm -hmm. they showed signs of, you know, some areas that even though their games are so complete, they they still have some areas where they can definitely iron out uh, on the mental side, and then also just uh, uh, you know, staying composed, closing out the match. Rune really tightened up in that fifth set. He was up 5-2, I believe. Oh, yeah, and he was 5-2, yeah. Selford at 5-3 and didn't play a good game at all and then had two match points. Rublev did really well to come back. I thought he was very composed and he came up with some big serves. And he, he sort of just <laughs> wasn't expecting to win, but he sort of was just like, if I can just get on the board. And he didn't want to repeat what he did uh, against Marin Cilic and Roland Garros last year. And I think he cited that match in his press, press conference afterwards, which I thought was very revealing. Okay, okay. Um, and then obviously you have the lucky net court at the end, yeah, which sort of which sort of went his way. But you know, I felt like there was just a lot of dips in that match, and neither player was playing their best at the same time. And it was one no. of those really, yeah, yeah. I I had some of the very very similar thoughts to you. Uh, I think uh, Runa I know was devastated in his press conference because he had chances, of course, in the fifth set, and I'll come to those in a second. But the match began, and and of course it seems such a long time ago. It was two games all. Love forty on the Rublev serve, thanks to just some sensational shots from from Holger Runa. And yeah. suddenly now it's Love forty. I think there was an unbelievable lob in that game that set him up to Love forty, and you just thought, okay, here we go. This is maybe the way the match I expected to go. I thought Runa would win, maybe in three or four sets. He didn't take advantage of that. Rublev then gets a break and kind of pretty much was always in front, if you like, until the fifth set. At least he was never behind. Uh, a, a, a big thing regarding the first three sets was that Runa's serve was was hit and miss first set was 48 percent. first serve in yeah. loses the set second set up to 65 percent. wins the set 
It's third set back down to 55, I believe, and loses that set. But when he goes a breakup in the fifth, and as you say, it was 5-2, I was closely watching Runa, bearing in mind how clutch he was in Paris Bercy last year, important moments in that final against Novak. I was particularly interested to see if he would repeat that level of, of coolness, if you like, under pressure. And I don't think he did. Uh, he soon, when he, he goes to 5-3, because that's on the Rublev serve. Rublev, by the way, I think senses some of the anxiety on the side of the net because I think he's getting a lot of balls in. He's posing a few questions of Runa. Uh, he's, by the way, also he's feeding off that um, anxiety. He's getting lots of first serves in uh, uh, this stage of the match, Rublev. I don't think Rublev was playing sensationally, but he's just playing well enough to ask the questions of Runa. And Runa was very tentative. So many balls were dropping short. He wasn't yeah. taking as many risks. And it wasn't until... Even though he gets a five-love lead in the tie break, it wasn't until 9-8, I think, on the Rublev serve that suddenly he feels relaxed again. Because even at five-love, you're, you're not quite far enough in front to relax, I don't think, in that tie break. And then yeah. it gets to 7-3, I think. So the anxiety is still there because you lose a couple of points and you're back in it. And at 9-8, he's down now. And for the first time, if you like, in that tie break, and uh, and it's a match point for Ru Rublev, and he pulls off because now he's his back's against the wall. What are you wow. going to do? You just got to play your best tennis, and he pulls off an, an, a remarkable backhand winner, gets to nine all. Rublev then holds for ten nine, and like you say, the net cord, funnily enough, hasn't really been spoken about much because there's so many other elements to that match. But uh, I still thought it was entertaining, but I couldn't agree more. Neither player hit the peaks at the same time. That's for sure. Yeah. And I still feel like, obviously, um, you know, Rune's ceiling is so much higher, and he's yeah. gonna, he's, you know, this is one of those losses like that you just gotta take. Yeah, <laughs> Alcaraz took it last year, and yeah, absolutely. Bradley, and it's one of those that could end up aging really well, uh, based on how the year goes. But you're right, like Rune got so tentative in yeah. some of those moments. He was dropping the ball quite a bit short, looping it rather than going after it, and definitely. You could you could definitely sense some of that tightness, and I know and I he's think, had issues with cramps in the past. And he looks a lot fitter now, but I think this was mostly all just mental. He had one physical issue, I think, in the start of the fourth, where he, yes, he, which he got treated. He got his blood pressure checked, I think, and then yeah, was uh, looked a little bit struggling in the heat. But I think he recuperated from that nicely, and he played a really bad game actually at five three in the fourth as well, and drop serve there, and then Rublev played a shocker of a game of a game at four five. And I thought after that, you know, Rune would win it like 6-2 or 6-3 in the in the fifth. But Rublev just hung in their state. I think ha having lost so many matches like this in the past, uh, that actually gave Rublev uh, more hope that he has not much to lose this time and he can just swing a little bit, you know, just ask the questions of his opponent and just not try to do too much, but also just, you know, just stay in there mentally. And he did that. And it'll be interesting to see how he fares in the quarterfinals. Because he's obviously been to six major quarterfinals in the past. Um, yeah. I think he's only won two sets in those six. Oh, wow. So he uh, he has a kind of a roadblock in these major quarterfinals then. Those two sets, I guess, came both against Chilich because that was five sets, right? Yep. Correct. What did, yep. he, what did he say about that? You said he mentioned it in his press conference, which I think is interesting. What did he say about that Chilich match? Well, he said that basically when he went down 7-2 in that fifth set super tiebreak, he kind of gave up. Oh wow! And 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 he sort of like lost all hope. Um, Chilich obviously played a fantastic super tie break, and there may not have been much Rublev could have done, but he just he he left that match with some regrets. He said, and Got he it. didn't want that to happen this time. So even when he was down five love and seven three and all these uh, trailing by all these score lines, just said, "I'm not going to do that this time." And I, he he sort of just said, "Okay, try to get one more, try to get to seven four, seven five, and then it just and then next thing you know, really quickly he was nine eight up." Yeah. So I, yeah, I think that's the right that you know, you when you are down like that, and listen, I've I've never played tennis to any great level. Um, but you are you I, I know it sounds like a cliche, but when you are that far down, yeah, just take one point at a time. You know, you I, I play a bit of yeah. ping pong and you're maybe you're down six one or something, and you're thinking, Well, listen, if I win the next point, there's a chance. If I win the next two points, which you know you you always any tennis player on the planet knows you're, you're capable of winning two points in a row against yeah. pretty much anyone else. So you could be you could be six one down to Rafa in the tie break, but any player in the in the top hundred, in fact, any player in the world, pretty much can win two points in the row, in a row against Rafa Nadal. And suddenly it's six three, and then you're like, well, okay, now yeah. we've, now it's game on. 
Yeah, essentially. And it's like even two breaks sometimes is just not enough. It just feels like the margins are that slim that even if you drop, let's say you lose one of the points on your serve and the other guy holds both of them. You know, next thing you know, it's like 6 4, 6 5, and then, you know, he's all of a sudden you're, you're 6 1, you're not even safe. Like, you know, we saw that tie break with Tiafo and Hatchnov. And yeah. Tiafo was 6 1 up in that fourth set tie break. And, and that was that was to seven, don't forget. So that's yeah. even more significant, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And we, we've seen some shocking super tie breaks uh, in the past. I really like this format a lot. Fifth set super tie break at 6 all. Um, does, I don't know how Daniel Collins feels about it. She didn't even realize. <laughs> Yeah, she celebrated early at 7-3, thinking she had won. That was funny. And she found it funny, too, which is kind of interesting. It's kind of cool that she thought it was funny, because I think I'd be, if I thought that, and then it didn't work out, I think that would really disrupt me. But she still <laughs> went on to win that quite comfortably. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we are at three games all here in, in the Tommy Paul match. I'll probably give this a bit more focus now. I've got my, my pasta uh, ready and um, in front of me. Uh, is that TU on there, Vanch? Uh, what's that? Is that tea you're drinking? I saw. I, I heard some some clattering of tea and and or, or spoons and mugs. I wasn't sure if you. Were oh, actually, that. I was just having a bowl of blueberries. Oh, okay, very healthy. <laughs> um. Okay. Yeah. So I'm I'm now erring back towards this this Shelton Tommy Paul match. So for those of you tuning in, wondering what's going on, that's still on serve. But uh, yeah, no, it's been it's been an interesting tournament. I don't think it's captivated me in the same way as either last year's Australian Open or the the U.S. Open did in particular, yeah. um, in a way. But maybe the le next couple of days might change that. I just feel as though on the men's side, the Tom Novak Djokovic does not need any assistance in Melbourne at all, and especially the form he's in. He's only lost once uh, since September, I think. In fact. Probably even his his record now, bearing in mind he won Wimbledon as well. From the French Open, I think he's only lost once. Am I right? Holger Rune? Yeah, Holger Rune and then one match at the Labour Cup, which you really kind of throw out against Felix. Yeah. Yeah. So so in terms of, of matches that we should count, at least, um, I think it's just one defeat in um in seven months, which is probably about um thirty odd matches, maybe more. Yeah, I think since he lost to Alcaraz in Madrid in that great semifinal. Yeah. So since the start of Rome, he's 45-3. and three. So he's... <laughs> so I've got two of his... I know Rafa is one, therefore, since then. Another one will be Runa. I wonder what the yeah, third and then, one is. And then, and then Felix, I guess. But Oh, they count the Felix one at the Lever Cup. Yeah. So ah. it's like, yeah, just really two with points. <laughs> Shelton is three all serving 40 30. So um we're looking at possibly four three on serve. Um okay. I didn't think they would count the, the Lever Cup. Yeah, I think they they counted for um ATP win loss records and head to heads, which okay. I personally think is kind of ridiculous because yeah, I mean, I do. you're playing a 10 point tie break and <laughs> there's no ranking points, and you know, you're being assisted by the likes of Federer and Nadal and Murray on the bench, and it's like, it it it's kind of weird why they do that, and then they don't add, uh, you know, like qualifying results or challenger results because those are actually part of the tour. Yeah, right. So it's very no, that strange. Just seem, does seem odd. Um, they, I think they should reevaluate that one. But anyway, okay. Um, certainly as well though, since since that match with Felix, he's only lost once, which of course was against Holger Holger Runa. I think. Okay. Listen, as uh, what I was about to say was, when we're back at Juice here. What I was about to say was that Novak doesn't need any assistance in Melbourne at all. And I'm sure you could probably give him seven top 10 players in a row and he may well still win the tournament. But there have been a few uh, stars aligning as well in terms of yeah. Alcaraz pulling out injured. Oh, that's a lovely drop shot there from uh, Ben Shelton. Wow. Advantage. Um, Alcaraz pulling out injured before the tournament begins. Then the draw, I think the first three rounds, certainly the first two rounds were where there was no banana skins there like a Jack Drape or anything like that right. um, in the first couple of rounds. Plus then, uh, you know, players like Kyrgios, of course, also going out injured. Plus then in addition to that, I think Holger Runa would have posed more questions potentially than Andre Rublev. Um, Daniel Medvedev, of course, is out too. So someone else who may, you know, has at least beaten Novak in a slam before and in a final. You know, so certain things have also aligned thinking, you know, this can't get much easier for him. 
Yeah, he really doesn't need much much assistance. And no, like doesn't. you said, I mean, Kyrgios pulled out before the start of the tournament. Rune, I agree with you, would have posed more of a challenge to Djokovic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, his fourth round, I mean, there was also PCB in there who's given him some trouble in the past. Yeah. He doesn't have that anymore. And uh, yeah, I mean, his base level right now, at, even at 80% or so, is good enough to beat most of these guys in best of five, especially. In fact, arguably all of them. And I think that's what, what listen, we may be here in, in, you know, in a few hours from now and Rublev has knocked him out. It, it's a tennis match. Two players yeah. are out there. There's always a chance. But what we're saying, though, is that Novak's level has got to go down somewhat, uh, mm -hmm. particularly from the level he showed against Di Menor. You know, he, he, we don't know about the hamstring as well. Uh, I certainly don't think it's really been an issue for him so far in terms of progressing. In fact, it hasn't. He's not dropped a set. But, yep. um, oh, no, he's dropped one set, sorry, against Kukra. But um, he's not really looked vulnerable at all, despite the injury. That could return. It is a, is it a muscular thing. It can feel great one day and then suddenly pop. It goes, and if it does that, then then you're out almost. But I do think we're looking, particularly in this Rublev match, uh, we're going to need something to something slightly different or unusual to happen that we haven't seen before. Yeah, I would agree. And then on the other side, um, Sebi Korda, that's a shame for him because I was watching that match yesterday and it didn't look obvious, the injury, until he takes the treatment. I must say, but now in hindsight, watching it, I did say, what's going on with the forehand, Sebi? You're going long here, left, right and centre that I wouldn't normally anticipate. Um, maybe he was feeling it in the first set. I don't know, but um, that's a real shame for him. Yeah, it's such a shame because he obviously had a great tournament beating Medvedev and then backing it up with Herkac. And he got very tight in that fifth set, super tight break against Herkac. But oh, then did he? I didn't see that. Then played three very very good points at seven all. That was a strange one because he was that, that was another match where neither player played their best at the same time and it went to a fifth set tiebreak. Mm -hmm. And um Herkac was three one up in that fifth set tiebreak, and then he tightened up a lot, and then Medvedev uh, uh, Korda got it back to seven, got it up to seven three, won six points in a row, and then he tightened up, and <laughs> then it was seven all, and then Korda was just a little bit bolder on those last three points. Okay. Just asking and her coach didn't do was a little bit too passive in my opinion, especially for especially from seven all to nine seven, and then they had a really good match point, I must say. And then Corda came up with a spectacular backhand pass down the line to seal it with with a victory. But uh, I was really bummed at that quarterfinal because I mean they're playing indoors that had a different feel to it. Hatchinov has become so so reliable and robust in these uh, majors. He really backs yeah. himself, especially best of five sets. Um, and he was doing such a good job of like wait, building these points and waiting for the right moment to attack and then using his backhand down the line like he did on the set point in the first set. And then he went up an early break, lost it. And Korda's forehand was a little bit spraying all over the place, I noticed. Yeah. You know, yeah. especially when, uh, you know, at first I just chalked it up to nerves. I didn't think there was any kind of an injury when That's he lost thought, the first, yeah. when he got the break. But then it started to get a little better. Like, you know, in the, in the tie break, he hit a couple of good ones and yeah. thought Hatchinov was just a little bit better. But then, but then uh, you know, it was on serve when he when he got it taped. It was 2-3. That's right. Yeah, 3-2. So, yeah. so that time I was thinking, okay, it's, you know, maybe hopefully it's minor. But then I saw there was a lot of tape. And then he was just not able to hit a forehand at all after that. And it was he just was shaking, yeah. shaking his hand after almost every point, looking at his team. And I think... Yeah, I, I hope it's personally. I hope it's minor because he made a he made a good amount of progress. I think he's in the top twenty five now, and he's, you know, probably headed towards the top ten. I think he'll get there, no doubt, in my yeah. opinion, because he's just yeah. so complete as a player. He has such a smooth game to watch. Takes the ball super early. Has great variety. Had a really excellent game plan against Medvedev. Yeah, and he built up such great leads in that Medvedev match that actually. Um, you know, he got a little bit tight in that in those sets also, and he could have won those a lot easier. Uh -huh. And then he pulls it out in the tie break. So, uh, yeah. The other thing as well is it's, it's another domino, if you like, or another card falling Novak's way. Because I just think, I just think that um, Sebi, they've played each other once, to the best of my knowledge, uh, yeah. but certainly once recently in in Adelaide, where um, Sebi had a match point in, in that in the in the second set, and. Um, 
I think a, a final, I would still back Novak day in, day out, especially in Melbourne, but any final for that matter. Um, but, you know, Sebi's game maybe troubles him a bit and it certainly did in Adelaide. And I just think that that was another one that, you know, if you're a Novak fan, Novak himself probably doesn't give a, doesn't care at all. He just takes each match as it comes and that's why he's a winner. But if you're a Novak fan and you're going, do I want to play Sebi Korda or Hatchinov potentially in the final? You're choosing Hatchinov. Yeah, absolutely. And he's he's so comfortable against Hatchinov. He's won like seven, their last seven or eight matches in a row. And the game plan is super clear. With Korda, um, there was tactically, there's a lot of things Korda can do to disrupt Djokovic's rhythm, like we saw in Adelaide. Like mm -hmm. he was hitting his kick serve really well. He was going backhand to backhand with him. And he really kind of stayed toe-to-toe -to -toe with him for three and a half hours and had a match point. And Djokovic had to hit a really difficult overhead to save it. Yeah. So um, and I, I do also think Djokovic was not nearly at his best in that final. I think some after effects also from the hamstring injury that he was feeling against Medvedev. Because mm -hmm. I think that's when he injured it, right? 4-2 in the first yeah. set um, yeah. against Medvedev, just reaching. It was a similar kind of movement that he did against Fritz in 2021 when he injured it. I think it was, like, if I'm not mistaken, that he was two sets to level up against Fritz, and then he was he going for yeah. a, a forehand squash shot slice on the move, and then he just kind of slipped over the paint, and then he mm -hmm. felt something in his abdominal muscle. Yeah, And I just think, like, he has such good, he has such a good team around him that helps him with like these recovery methods and training uh -huh. that he's probably just spending like 24 hours just just healing this thing and just trying to do everything possible. I mean, he said he was even taking medications and he never does that. He's yeah, right, against, yeah. uh, anti-inflammatories and of any kind. He usually prefers natural healing over any yeah. kind of uh, any kind of medicine. So I think it definitely has to had to have affected him uh, him a lot, but I don't think it affected him at all against Demon Orr. He said he felt no pain and certainly showed. And I think he really, really had extra motivation in that Dimonor match. I think he particularly didn't like some of the comments that Dimonor made about him last year. I think um, about the whole uh, deportation saga. I think, you know, oh. maybe, maybe that's not even a factor. Maybe that's just something, but, you know, as if Djokovic needs any other motivation, right? What did Dimonor say? I'm not aware of that. I, To be honest, I, I think him, Djokovic's fans might know it better than me, but I think he's just kind of like, rolled his eyes and or something when he was asked about the question he's like yeah this is very interesting or something just you know kind of implying that he didn't really he didn't really buy Novak's story about uh, getting COVID or something okay mm -hmm. um, that whole part of it but I I don't know maybe did Novak mention it no no certainly not okay um, but but he was asked in the on-court interview interestingly you know he was asked afterwards uh, by Jim Courier why did you Play this well, okay. And then, and then he said, uh, "I, you know, I just wanted to." Like, or the, <laughs> the question was like, the question was like, "Why did you beat Diminor the way you yeah. did?" I mean, it's an unusual question from Jim on this occasion. <laughs> I think. I mean, I'm calling you Jim. I've never met him, but um, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, maybe how, but why? You know. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. He was like, I just wanted to, and then he's like, "I don't <laughs> regret it. I don't regret not giving the crowd a good match because you know it was." You know, because he he wanted to he wanted to just go out there and get the job done, and he didn't want to play any kind of long rallies or anything, and he was just ruthlessly efficient, um, just scary good. And it, do you it, think honestly, that that may be because he doesn't want to test the hamstring too much? I think so, because I think there's certain movements that he still probably struggles a little bit with, like the open stance backhand. You know, maybe maybe just slightly, maybe even just five or ten percent. So he kind of I think he said it's like there in his mind. Point. It is still there in his mind during these matches and these points. Yeah, so he definitely wants to. And and he's he's super capable of just firing winners and hitting big ground strokes and the court speed helps him and his his serve has become such a weapon that he's hitting yeah. all the spots and Dimonor had like no read on his serve whatsoever and then I think like from the ground I think Gil Gross tweeted this that he had zero winners from the ground yeah that's why yeah I saw just, that yeah. he was just not able to get into any kind of rallies whatsoever and there was just such a big discrepancy in firepower from the baseline. Um, because Dimonor obviously he loves to use the pace of his pace of his opponent and sort of hit these flat shots, but Djokovic was just constantly keeping running him, keeping him moving all over the place, and shots were over in less than four shots, so most of them, and it was just such a big advantage. So neither Shelton nor Paul is making really much of an impression on either serve at the moment. Um, oh. I'm waiting for a break point or even a, a love thirty to appear, and then. 
as an ace there from Tommy Paul meaning 30-15. What has Rublev, give, give me some, if I'm Andre Rublev, if I'm on his team or I'm his biggest fan, what, what's got to happen for him to, to win today? First of all, he cannot be so hard on himself. He has to take every single error that he hits on the chin. If I'm yeah. him, I don't want to show him, I don't want to show any kind of vulnerability to Djokovic because he will seize that like no one else does out there. And he already did in the World Tour Finals when they played each other. Yeah. Rublev and Djokovic were going neck and neck for about mm -hmm. nine games. Mm -hmm. There was very little separating them. Andre was playing the playing his normal game. He was you know, hitting these big forehands, taking the ball super early, serving big, um, really high percentage of first serves, and, you know, wasn't intimidated for about nine games. But then he lost the putt. Yeah. And it was only an inch. But then you give these greats an inch and they take a mile, as they say, right? <laughs> so I think that's one thing. He absolutely cannot have any kind of emotional letdown. And I think if he can just... I, I think tactically, if he can... I actually think his backhand has improved a little bit since last year, and I, I think he can defend okay. a little bit better on it than he used to. So maybe he can, you know, just try getting Djokovic into some lengthier exchanges, um, backhand to backhand, and just and just sort of see what he can do with, when an opening comes. Because if you're keeping Djokovic, sort of you're mixing... The, the problem with Rublev in this matchup is he doesn't really mix up his game a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So it becomes kind of predictable, and it's kind of in the strike zone of wherever Djokovic wants it. And... He's kind of at the mercy of his uh, of Djokovic because it's so on his racket. And the issue also for him is the second serve. I feel like Djokovic yep. is just all over that every time they play each other. Um, unless it's a clay court, then I think uh, Rublev maybe has a better advantage. He did beat him in Belgrade. Yeah. Uh, but it, They've played each other three times. It's only two and one. It feels like yeah. they, they could have and should have played each other much more often. And it feels, and, and it feels like a, a bad matchup for... Yeah. Rublev, and yet the, the matchup is only 2-1. But I think that is aided a little bit with that match in Belgrade that Novak was still feeling his way into the season, if you like, after obviously the absence he had at the beginning in, in January and February and missing the, yeah. the two, the, the, the sunshine double, if you like, as well. So he had one tournament, I think, before that, Dubai. Maybe two, Monte Carlo might be before that. But he goes out early in Monte Carlo. He's still yeah. feeling his way in. That is not the Novak that was in Madrid or in Rome or in Paris that we yeah. saw. Yeah, not at all. And also in that tournament, he was coming back from a set down in pretty much every match that he played. Yeah, he was, yeah. Um, and so, uh, and then he completely gassed out in the third set, kind of yeah. just, Was you it 6 love the final set? or six? It was 6 love. yeah. He was yeah. pretty much a shadow of himself. And many people were very worried, um, as they have been about Djokovic in the past on the, on the early part of the clay season, but then usually by Rome and Paris, he's usually in really good peak shape. Yep, indeed he is. Uh, we're at 30.15 here on the Shelton serve. As I said, I, I don't recall one break point yet, but I was in the kitchen for a couple of games, so I might have missed something. But, yeah, I um, think there was just there was just one in the third game of the match, one okay. all 30-40, and Shelton saved it with an ace. Uh, not an ace, but an unreturnable down the tee. Okay, we're 30 all now on the Shelton serve, so we might get to see another one. Um, you, so you've gone for Shelton in this, uh, did, I, did I hear you say, or did you go for the experience slightly like I did? I went a little bolder. I went. I went with Shelton just because I feel like he's playing with such swagger and house money that, and and he's been doing really well in these tie breaks. Yeah, uh, fair enough. Particularly um, against JJ Wolf. I didn't see that match, but um, did that go? That went five, right? It did. Yeah, he was down two sets to one. I think he saved a couple of break points, start of the fourth, and then I I, I didn't get to watch a whole lot of it as well, but. Um, one thing I do remember remarking on, although I didn't watch the match, was that, of course, he's serving second in that uh, fourth set. So he's, yeah. and he, in the fifth set, he eked out a pretty early advantage. I think he won the fifth set 6 2. But in other words, he's 4 5, serving at stay in the match, 5 6, serving at stay in the match. As you said, he had a couple of break points faced as well at the beginning of the fourth set. So there was plenty of pressure on him and then goes into the tiebreak and, and wins it. Yeah, absolutely. And he also won tiebreak against Paparin. And I think I um, playing, play, yeah, playing in these uh, college atmosphere, uh, and for so many months like he did, and getting that experience, I think has really helped him actually on the main tour because, I mean, he is he was taking on the Aussie crowd and just feeding off of their energy wow. and just really thriving in that atmosphere. And he's just playing like a kid with so much joy and just he's not he doesn't feel like an ounce of nerves right now, 
which uh, is only going to last a very short period of time for sure. You would imagine, you'd imagine, yeah. I mean, six five now, so a bit of pressure back on Tommy Paul's shoulders. Um, coming back to sort of the Novak fan scenario, you, would you rather play Tommy Paul, the sort of more known quantity? I think so, but he hasn't played Tommy Paul either. So no, this is the first no. time meeting for Djokovic in either regard. Um, but I'm curious to see if we do get Shelton versus Djokovic, like uh, how Djokovic would would go about taking apart this guy's serve because Shelton has a huge second serve as well. Okay. And he can really hit kind of any any spot in the box. And I think he has the fastest serve this tournament, I think at 141 miles per hour. I don't know if that's still a still the record, but it was in the first week. Okay. So... I mean, I'm just trying to think of people in their first ever Grand Slams. This is uh, Shelton's second. But um, was Becker, when he won at 17 at Wimbledon, was that his first ever Grand Slam? I'm not sure. not sure if he played the French or in Australia that year. Um, but that was a, a fairly unprecedented run. But, I mean, Shelton getting to the quarterfinals at only his second ever Grand Slam um, suggests he's on for a pretty stellar career. Yeah, absolutely. And he... Um... I think this is only the fourth American in the Open era to get to the quarters um, and their debut in Australia. I think Agassi actually won it on his debut, but that was because he just couldn't play the tournament. He just chose not to play the tournament for many years. And then he played it in 95 and ended up winning it. Okay. And then I think I think Patrick McEnroe uh, did it in 1989. He got to the semis. And okay. then you have... Um, Tennis Sangren, I think, in 2018. That was his first time in the main draw. Okay. And then now you have Shelton, but Shelton is younger than all those guys were. He's only 20. Yeah, right. I mean, we've obviously Alcaraz in particular last year took the tennis world by storm, if you like, um, as, as Shelton goes long there on a forehand, so it's 30 love to Tommy Paul. Uh, but Runa, of course, has been in the news a lot, in particular when he won Paris Bercy in, in October, I think it was, uh, beginning of November. Um, is Shel when when do we start putting Shelton in that in that conversation? Now? I wouldn't say now because I, I mean, what is he at right now? He's like top fifty now, like forty three or something yep. in the world. If he if he wins this match, uh, then we can start talking a little bit more seriously. But I would say. I want to see what he does after a run like this. Like after after Australia, I'd imagine he's going to lose in the semis, most likely. Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, that's like the safe bet that you would you know you would you would bank on him getting to at best the semifinals in this tournament. And mm -hmm. then I want to see if he just how long he's able to keep it up. Yeah. And if guys are able to figure it out, because he also had Karatsev a couple yeah. years ago. I think yeah, he, yeah, he, made, he made the semis uh, from qualifying and then. He sort of had a good run, like in Dubai and Doha in the Middle East, mm -hmm. and then like had one or two good clay results, and then had like a a big dip for like six or seven months, and then he yeah. won another title in October, and then really has kind of fallen off ever since. Yeah, but, he has. I think he won it. I, I have a lot more hope in Shelton just because he's had a very successful career, and uh, he seems to have a lot more tactical awareness as well with the, with how he plays. Mm -hmm. um, there's just some non-negotiable weapons with the serve and the forehand and the transition game that I just feel like will take him really, really far. And he seems like a really good athlete, really committed. So, He's at uh, 30 all now on the Tommy Paul serve. So it's two points either way. And we'll see how this pans out, uh, Tommy Paul serving 30 all. But a bit of pressure now on on uh, Tommy's shoulders. From time to time, I keep wanting to say the Americans' shoulders, but of course that could apply to either player. Uh, 30 all anyway, Tommy Paul, are you going to get your first serve in here? No, you're not. Um, oh yeah, by the way, yeah, good point, Dominic, there in the, in the chat. They're saying it's a good day for New Balance out there and Yonex as well. Is it Yonex or Yonex? Yonex probably. Oh, I always thought it was Yonex, but I'm oh, it's, maybe it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it could be. Anyway, whatever. Good day for those brands. Uh, but Tommy Paul with an excellent first serve there. Um, I think that seemed to have a bit of a kick on it. Let's have an, uh, another look at it. But uh, Shelton certainly struggled to uh, to deal with it on the backhand side. So it's 40-30. Pretty good return there from Shelton. Uh, pretty far out of the court. Some good depth as well. Uh, they're now into the middle of a rally from the backhand to the forehand. So Shell uh, always mixed that one up. 
So Shelton, of course, being a lefty, I don't know if that makes anything, anything interesting for Novak potentially in the next round. Oh, that's a lovely mm. volley there, Tommy Paul at the net, forcing the tie break. Yeah, okay. I mean, does that, how does that help or hinder, you know, if, if you're going in, if you're an unknown quantity, you're playing Novak Djokovic, you're a lefty, does that add to the to the unknown quantity element to it all? Um, I think if Djokovic is not quite dialed in when he's um, having to do the splits on on the returns, and maybe if he's feeling something in his ham hamstring, particularly in the backhand corner, mm -hmm. um, potentially Shelton could get a lot of more easy holds than some of the other opponents, like a lot more than Dimonor, for example, with his type of game. But um, it could either go that way, or Djokovic could just be absolutely dialed in and just having studied Shelton's serving patterns and having watched him. These guys are, I mean, I know Djokovic is like, he has a big data guy in his team and he like does the scouting report and he, he'll he be super prepared for whichever serve comes his way. And he's usually so good at like just blocking and getting a lot of returns back deep that then he works his way back to neutral super quickly. It's not quite like an Agassi style of returning where Agassi would just hit a lot of return winners. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, I remember Agassi quite well and, and and the return i mean he's a, a he was a more diminutive character so if you if your return is not on then 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 that but i mean he's probably the player i remember growing up with the best return on tour but you were you were suggesting that agassi would go for for the return winner whereas Djokovic goes for the return uh, maybe sometimes at the feet i remember so many times against rafa rafa suddenly just finished his service motion and he's already trying to fish the ball out from from his feet if you like um, because novak has put yeah. it exactly there already um so uh, it's no lacking in aggression necessarily, but perhaps he, he doesn't go for the lines quite as often on the return as maybe Agassi did for, in terms of the winners. Yeah, he's more sort of Gumby-like. So he'll sort of he'll sort of stretch, get the ball right at the opponent's feet. And the key thing for him is just depth. The depth and yeah. just, um, I think sometimes when he's really feeling it, he can hit that forehand cross-court winner like he did against Federer on the match point. Or just yeah. certain, certain winners when he's just really dialed in. But most of the time he's just going to make you play so many extra shots after the serve. 2-1, uh, Tommy Paul leads in the tie break. Three points so far, all on serve. So Shelton is now serving at 1-2. Um, very much sort of following the pattern of, of large parts of the first set. But maybe we're, we're, the match is about to come alive here. Uh, as Shelton goes for the drop shot, doesn't quite work. And Tommy Paul goes long there. There was a chance for for mm. paul it was not easy there was an opportunity to do one of those sort of flicked ones that you could so you come into the net here and you could flick it to the right um or just sort of deftly try and take it down the line uh, i must say that i think shelton left that i think shelton could have got a racket on it but decided to leave it and turned out to be the yeah. right choice because it's too all second serve here shelton Two all, second serve, Ben Shelton goes down the tee and it's an unreturnable. Not the fastest of serves, but the placement was excellent and perhaps maybe even caught Tommy Paul by surprise. And it's 3-2, so still very much on serve. Those of you just tuning in, make sure you hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you are new. Uh, how was your day at work, by the way? I heard you say you've just sort of come home from work and... Setting in for your evening. What time is it? Is it about nine o'clock where you are? 9. Yeah, it's about nine. Um, I left the house in the morning, I want to say around 7 30. Mm -hmm. And I got to work around 8 10. Just had a super busy day. Probably left the office at seven. So I had um lunch and dinner with my team. Uh -huh. And we're just working on this really big engagement right now. So things are pretty busy. But the good thing is that I started my day early. And actually, I was looking forward to coming back before the Shelton Paul match. So okay. I'm glad that I didn't miss a whole lot. And I also got to catch quite a bit of Sabalenka Vekic, which was nice. Yeah. I believe the women's semifinals are going to be on in the evening session tomorrow, um, yeah. I believe. Um, what yeah, have we got? Nights, they're, they're night session matches. So yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I'm guessing no, no men's matches tomorrow. So it'll be the women's semifinals. Just trying, what day is it today? It's now Wednesday, isn't it? So yeah, into Thursdays yeah. it will be in Australia. Anyway, uh, three all here. Tommy Paul serving. Goes wide. Uh, so that's to the backhand of Shelton. And it's 4-3. So no points as yet dropped on serving this tie break. And now the pressure goes back onto the young American Ben Shelton's shoulders 
at three four. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're either not working or a student, uh, although to some extent, even if you are working, the Aussie Open is not too bad in terms of at least in, in California, you probably get to see a good five or six hours of tennis in the evening. Yeah, that's usually usually at the night session is where you end up missing a lot of the action. Yeah, and maybe some of the day session, especially in the early rounds, um, just because the scheduling was a bit wild, and obviously you had the rain which set. Uh, players back and then you had some players who were kind of already in the third round and then some hadn't finished their first round matches so that yeah. was a bit of a bit of a wild ride because also in australia it's like you never know with the weather it can be raining and then it can also yeah. be just like 105 degrees the next day i've been to melbourne uh well i've been to melbourne the city a couple of times but i've actually been to the australian open as well uh once in 2006 and uh yeah certainly the day i was there was was yeah, not far off four seasons in one day. Certainly, it, it, oh, that's a lucky net cord there for Shelton. 5-4, he leads. So they're still on serve. Yeah, it's not quite four seasons in one day, but certainly I remember the day going anything between sort of 18 and, and 35, and that's obviously in Celsius. And one moment the wind was really up, and then the next minute it was super dry and baking hot. And uh, yeah, you can have some unusual days in, in terms of weather, that's for sure. And, I remember, for example, the Friday of last year when it was on the semi-final when uh, it was really pelting down with rain. Uh, yeah. And then Berrettini Nadal was inside as, as, as Tommy Paul serves excellently. So it's five all. Um, still no break of serve in terms of these points. Intriguing is probably the word I would use uh, rather than pulsating, but really five all in the tie break. We are at make or break, you would think, one way or another. So Tommy Paul's serving five all. Is it going to be, it's going to be set point for one or the other here? And it's going to be set point for Tommy Paul. Yeah. Two excellent first serves for Paul. Indeed. Indeed. So now Shelton is serving five six, facing a set point. He's been, oh, uh, oh you, you, you're probably slightly ahead of me, are you, Vanch? Yes, but I think you'll see it right now. All right, here we go. So Tommy, uh, Ben Shelton, sorry, serving, goes out wide. Tommy Paul goes long, but it was uh, it was a tricky one. It was heading towards the corner. And Actually, I, was, I kind of reacted like he had, like the set was over. So that was just okay. Yeah, it was heading towards the corner, and because I knew how you'd reacted, I thought, is this gonna just just gonna just land in and catch the line? But it didn't. So it's six yeah. all. I mean, it was a really, really tricky circuit. I, I, deal I think the reason one. I said "oh" is I was just trying to—I was trying to think. Okay, is he going to go wide or is he going to go down the tee? Because okay. he can hit both pretty well, and he obviously he went wide, which is a good play for the tee. Even though Paul has a very good backhand. Six all, Shelton serving. Where are you going to go with this one? Down the tee on this occasion. Forehand to the backhand of uh, Tommy Paul. Now they're on the backhand side for. Shelton, as he they exchange backhand to forehands because they're opposite handed, and Shelton puts it into the net. And so we've got the first point against serve. Now, Tommy Paul is leading 7 6 with a set point, but on this occasion, it's on his serve. 7 6, he leads. Set point number two. Let's see where you go with this serve. Okay, Tommy Paul goes wide to the forehand of Shelton. Uh, now he's on the forehand as well for Shelton again during the rally here. Tommy Paul getting some good depth there on his forehands. Not on that one, though, he's not. Um, now that, oh, but the backhand from Shelton goes into the net and it's first set Tommy Paul by seven games to six. I am going to play a one minute video just to let you know what's been going on down under in the last 24 hours. And then I'll get Vanch's thoughts on that first set.
And we are back with you. Tommy Paul has won the first set 7-6. It was a fairly tight, um, not exactly pulsating first set. Came alive uh, at the end of the tie break with a couple of errors into the net from Shelton. What are your thoughts on that first set and that tie break in particular, Vanch? Yeah, I thought it was a pretty uh, intriguing first set tie break. Um, you know, it's one of those where... Shelton was maybe just a little bit too eager to pull the trigger on yeah. a couple of backhands, and he probably would have done better if had he just put a little bit more shape and shape on his shots over there rather than sort of just flattening it out and um, you know both of them in the net. But that's really what decided it. Like there wasn't the there wasn't really a whole lot else in it as far as uh, you know turning points or key moments that you could really highlight. It just came down to those two backhands in the net. And I think uh, apart from that, Tommy did well to not drop a serve in the tie break. Came yeah. up with those two big serves uh, to move ahead and get, get the set point. And I always feel like if you're able to do that in tie breaks and just get that scoreboard pressure, um, all it takes is just one error from the opponent. And Tommy did well to capitalize. Yeah, he did. Uh, it was, uh, I think it was both backhands. I think it wasn't into the net, wasn't it, from Shelton? I think. Yeah, both of them in the net. Yeah, definitely in the net. Um, but yeah, it was a really tight first set with both players comfortably holding serve. Tommy Paul is serving first in this second set and he leads 30 love. Um, but yeah, super tight. And it's just one of those which, which um, can go either way. Maybe, maybe a little bit of experience from Tommy Paul in that tie break. I mean, Tommy Paul, by the way, is not the most experienced guy on tour, but but he's he's played more than two Grand Slams before. But but then maybe I'm just just saying that because it fits the narrative. You know, the more experienced player wins, yeah. especially on the back of a couple of unforced errors. But then also inexperience can also be a case of not knowing when to pull the trigger. So it's really tricky. It's a fine balance. Yeah. And uh, I think the more matches that you play at this level, you get that balance right. Although this is Tommy Paul's first quarterfinal, but he's had some other big yeah. moments um, in his career. Obviously, took out Alcaraz last year in Canada, uh, beat Nadal in the first round Nadal of Paris. Paris. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he's been coming on pretty, pretty strong and he plays well on the big stage. The way he played against Rafa in, the, in sets two and three uh, in Paris actually made me think that he would make the semi-finals, where I think he was on a course to play uh, Djokovic in the semi-finals in Paris. But you know, I thought he might pose Novak a few troubles just with the way he'd been playing so well, like I say, against Rafa. But then I think he easily won his next match. I forget who it was against. But then he came up against Tsitsipas, and I had him to beat Tsitsipas. But um, Tsitsipas knocks him out and ends up meeting Novak in the semi. And that brings us nicely to the fact that Tsitsipas in that match came is it seven matches in a row for Novak that he's won against Steph something like that um, um I see nine in a row actually nine in a row is it is it, is it what, what's the what's the head head is it nine and oh it's a uh, 10-2 for Djokovic 10-2 yeah right sorry I, I had a feeling it I had a, for some reason I thought it was 7-2 but but anyway I see Pat Cash there in the in the crowd um but yeah regarding that I mean the, because the reason why I mentioned it is because actually that day Steph could have and should have probably won that semi-final yeah, that was a really that was a really good match. Um, it, it came down to that tie break, and it looked for a while like Djokovic was going to win it in straights, but then yes. Steph obviously uh, he got the crowd engaged. He started his forehand and serve when they're clicking on all cylinders. You can see you can see just how dangerous he can be, especially with his uh, you know all court game, and he's got some nice variation now with the slice. And uh, he he really played well that day because he was in danger of that being a blowout, just like it was in Astana and when they played in Rome and some of their other matches. Just felt like Djokovic was really getting the hand of that matchup. But then things got exciting, and um, yeah, he had his chances. Uh, but yeah, uh, it was a close, well fought third set tiebreak. And I wonder if we'll get a repeat of that match in the final here, because obviously well, Tsipas, you know, playing very well in this tournament and also in the United Cup. I liked what I was seeing from him. Um, he was doing a really good job of, you know, protecting his backhand. Obviously, he loves playing in Australia. This is his home stamp, and he's really, particularly, been really clutch on breakpoint down this tournament. I think he's saved forty-three out of forty-nine breakpoints that he's faced, and of many of those were against Yannick Sinner. Um, I think four, he was Sinner was something like four out of twenty-six on breakpoints in that match, uh -huh. and didn't play a very good game in the fifth set to get broken. But 
I thought Tsitsipas did very well in the sets that he did win, one, two, and five, and was really all over Yannick. Yeah, I, I, I felt, uh, as it often needs to be when a player comes back into it, I did feel that Steph did dip a bit in sets uh, three and four in that match. And I think yep. Sinner, as you said, had about 25 break points in the match in, in its entirety, something like that. Yeah, four, it was well over 26. But 26. here's the thing about those break points is um, I saw many people, you know, you know, using that stat a lot on Twitter and sort of, uh, you know, using it as a way to say like, okay, yeah, Sinner needs to get more clutch. But I mm -hmm. actually felt like, you know, sets three and four, you know, he could have won those much easier than he did, right? It was six, three, six, four for, for Yannick in sets three and four. But if uh -huh. you look at the overall stats, he was four for 26 on break points, but he was two for 18 in sets three and four, which he ended up winning. So, you know, on the, on the other sets that he lost, he was two for eight, which I guess at that point is, you know, not a terrible conversion. It's, it's what you would expect when you lose sets four, four, and three, like the way he did. But um, and I think the other stat was that of those twenty six break points, Steph came up with the first serve on twenty two of them. Ah. So that's uh, you know that's certainly big when you're able to pull out those first serves like that. I mean that's also clutch in itself. I mean, yeah. I, I, I think whether you whether you have a break point or whether you're facing one, it's a, a sort of your heart might go a bit faster. Oh, a little net cord there for Shelton. At, at a pretty useful moment. For, so he holds serve to make it one game all here. Um, back to today's match. Ghibli there asking, was that a good first set? I saw the second half of it and wasn't sure what to make of it. Ghibli, you and me both, but I would say that that was pretty much throughout. I think we had, uh, from, from memory, at least uh, Vance jogging my memory, I think we only had one break point throughout the whole yeah. of the first set. And the tie break followed suit, and it wasn't until five all that that, that tie break and match came alive. And really, the first two games of this second set has, has mirrored that in that, that neither has faced a break point and looked reasonably comfortable. Uh, Ghibli, in fact, uh, Vanch and I, we haven't seen each other for a few weeks, so we were kind of reacquainting ourselves and talking about various other things that were going on in the tennis world over the last 10 days. Uh, but that was also because the first um, 12 games of the match, if you like, were fairly unremarkable. So I don't think you missed a huge amount. Um, any thoughts on what I've said? And uh, Would you like to add anything, Vanch? Yeah, it's one of those one of those matches has been really serve dominant and not been a whole lot of cat and mouse. You know, there've been some good putaways at the net, but not necessarily cat and mouse tennis that has uh, the crowd going, you know, gasping for air and exactly. it hasn't they, they haven't they haven't really had some of those highlight real exchanges yet. And I'm sort of waiting for that to happen. So far we're about an hour into this match and you know, that first set was certainly in, intriguing and it had its gripping moments in the last three or four points, but uh there, there wasn't really a whole lot to really go in depth and analyze, I guess. So it was nice for us to cover some other topics about the tournament as a whole. Indeed it was. I'm going to put a comment up on the screen while I go and retrieve a coffee that I'm making. I don't know if you can see the screen. If not, I can read it out to you. Oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah, caught the second set of Cyberlinka, and she looks very good. Her against any of Azarenka or Rabakina would be on form, would be decent. Yeah, to me, I think uh, Sabalenka and Rabakina are the two most impressive players on the women's side this tournament. Uh, they've certainly looked the best uh, amongst all the players that I've watched. I mean, certainly Azarenka was very impressive against Pagula. And uh, this is... Usually when she gets to this stage in, in the tournament, she's at least made the final, if not won. So I'm uh, excited about that Rybakina Azarenka semi. You have you have Sabalenka to win the tournament, right? Yep, I do, and this is the best I've felt about it. Um, I've never actually picked Sabalenka ever to win a major in any kind of prediction or anything like that. I just didn't really trust her sometimes in the big moments, but it's been completely different. I want to say since uh, since really Guadalajara, actually. Yeah, last year. I mean, I know yeah, she I got agree. the final to Garcia, but that just came down to a couple of double faults in the tiebreak. And I thought that was a very high quality, well played match. And she did beat Fiontech in that semi. And yeah. She did pretty well in her round group stage matches as well. So I like the way she's been playing. And she's not usually been able to carry that into the next season and have, go beyond the fourth round of the Australian Open. So now she's done that and she hasn't dropped a set. Um, I mean, in any just, match this year. exactly. A couple of things as well from Ghibli. And I'd like to add something that you've just said about Savalenka as well. Um, uh, something about not, the fans don't seem to have got behind anyone that much. Well, Ghibli, I guess that they, they, they're a bit, um, probably the average tennis fan may not be familiar that much, that familiar with either player. Um, they probably don't know much about a narrative, either one, it's two Americans as well. So it's not like 
there's a load of Croatians or Greeks supporting their 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 player out there today, or of course Australians. Um, anything else to add? Of, oh yeah, regarding Sabalenka, she was under threat in the first set today in that she was double mm -hmm. faulting a bit. That was returning. Bearing in mind, I think she double faulted in the entire match against Ben Shipp four times. Today, she double faulted, um, I'm going to say, four times in the first game or maybe the first two service games. In addition to that, I'm completely in agreement with Vanch regarding Sabalenka's form over the last six months. I'd probably even go back as far as the US Open and that match mm -hmm. with Kai Kanepi. From that moment onwards, I mean, she could have and should have beaten Sviontek in the semi-final, yep. she's a breakup in the third set, but maybe the nerves got to her again, semi-final stage. But of course, playing Sviontek in a semi-final is very different to playing uh, Magda uh, Lynette, where she will be the favourite. So that's a different dynamic to consider. In addition to that, um, I would also then go from that New York tournament through Guadalajara, uh, as, as Vanch said. I think she beat Sviontek in the semi-final there, I'm going to say, in Guadalajara. Yep. Um, I think she's one in the third. Yeah, yes. right. Exactly. Very impressive. Then, of course, she takes that form. And, and I completely agree with what you said about the final. That match against Garcia was a very high level. It wasn't that one or one or other player didn't turn up or or was underperforming because of the pressure. I think they both performed. It was a it was such a fine margin. Garcia takes it. Fair enough. I I, I actually saw that as a as a positive that tournament for Savalenka. And she's taken into the new year, impressively winning in Adelaide, where she played one a good, two good. Sometimes you win a 250. Uh, I just think that there was probably more stock to be taken from, uh, I think actually it might, might be the 500 actually that she won in Adelaide. Yeah. But either way, the pre-tournaments in Adelaide and Auckland were very different. Coco Goff winning in Auckland uh, was a very different nature to, to winning that tournament, not dropping a set compared to Sabalenka's win in Adelaide. And, um, yeah, I took all of that, put it all together, and I had Sabalenka winning the tournament. So there we go. Yeah. And I also just like the way she's been talking a lot. Uh, oh, by the way, you at right. I, I keep saying Guadalajara because I keep thinking of the WTA finals there. Oh, my there. gosh. I've been saying Guadalajara as well. No, it was in Fort too. Worth. It was in Fort Worth. Yeah. yeah. I, it's, you know, it's Guadalajara was 2021. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, it's because actually about two or three months before, funnily enough, I was talking to Jack uh, about this. And um, I think we were both sort of saying, yeah, I think it's going to be in Guadalajara again, blah, 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 blah. But in the end, um, it, it was a sort of a not a last minute change because they didn't confirm Guadalajara. But it was certainly a last minute um, addition, if you like, or last minute moment that they said, by the way, it's going to be in Fort Worth. Uh, so, yeah. By the way, Ghibli's asking a question referring to Damien. Damien was with me earlier for that match. He was... Listen, Damien doesn't get excited much, and he certainly doesn't get excited much if it's not a challenger, but he was pumped about Magda's match today. He was very pleased that she made it through to the semifinals. She will ask questions of Sabalenka, no doubt, but unlike the other semifinals that Sabalenka is, well, I guess there was pressure on Sabalenka to beat Fernandez in terms of her being the favorite, but I just thought Layla had done so much in that route to the semifinals that showed that Layla was going to be a real, real tough nap to crack. That, um, I think this Lynette one, for me, has a slightly different dynamic. We've got a break point here for Tommy Paul, by the way, 30-40. Um, I'll probably just talk through this point before I go back to the kitchen and get my coffee. 30-40, Shelton to serve. Uh, first break point of the second set. And where are you going to go with this, Shelton? You are going into the net. That's where you're going with it. Uh, second serve here for uh Ben to uh, to use, and he goes to the backhand side. It's a good second serve, to be fair. Attacks the net and wins the point. All about the serve there, right, Vanch? Yep, all about that serve. And he did it on the second serve as well. So he's been do doing that really well this whole tournament. Looks like it's game point now for Shelton. And he misses the pickup at the net. That was an interesting. He wanted to serve in volley, but Paul really dipped it low at his feet and got it super low. Yeah. Yeah, it may have been the wrong choice, but it's a good return. Um, maybe there was a slightly tentative approach. It's, it's always tricky to tell, particularly as it happens. Yeah. 
But anyway, juice. Uh, here we go, Ghibli here. Magda beating Cardo and KP is big, uh, but you get the feeling that they both uh, did a bench at Shinsaku against Vaducano. Uh, Magda, 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 Magda beating Cardo and KP. KP? Oh, Pliskova. Uh, uh, Garcia, yeah, 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 of course. Um, yeah, I thought Garcia was quite poor in that match. Okay, uh, she was three love up in the first set. She was, she was three love up. She was double break up. Yeah, exactly. And she, she, had, she made less than 50% of her first serves the entire match. And... I think like 33, 34 and four stars. It was just not a great performance from her. I thought she would, I expected a little bit more from her this tournament. And yeah. I was very impressed with her against Fernandez. And even 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 against, uh, who did she play after that? Sigmund. I think she dropped that first set 6 1. But, uh, and really was looking awful. And in the past, she might have lost a match like that, but she came through it. And so I thought, okay, this is a really good opportunity to get to the semis, play Sabalenka. Yeah. But uh, double break up against Lynette. But I just felt like she was just a little bit too stubborn. Um, you know, obviously playing the, we know what she likes to do, take the return super early, uh -huh. almost half volley them, come to the net, play super aggressive. And that's kind of her style. And she wants to stick with that and make that a part of her DNA. But then I just feel like sometimes she's not giving herself enough options when it isn't working. And I thought she might've been better off maybe because she's so, she, she, she's a good mover as well. She's fast. She's quick around the court. I know at least we, you and I both love that match. She played against Kazakina at the World Tour Finals. Uh -huh. And she, she actually did show quite a bit of flexibility and adaptability in that match. Yep. And I thought against um, you know a, a good defender and a good uh, consistent player like the net, I thought she would utilize more of those opportunities, but she really didn't. And didn't play a very good tie break either. And um, yeah, played one or played a poor service game to get broken in the second set as well. Yeah, um, uh, but of course, Lynette is a very good player as well, and she's pulled off some big upsets in majors that you wouldn't necessarily expect. So it's a, been a good tournament from her side, but I just felt like uh, Garcia left some stuff, left something to be desired. Yeah, I mean, a double break up, as you say, is a is a is a significant advantage to squander, but. I will say this, I'll add to your uh, concerns over being stubborn, etc. in that I felt against Jabur in the semifinals yeah. of the US Open, and the, the exact same thoughts. I didn't um, sense it so much in that ma Lynette match. I, I know I was watching it. I'm trying to think if I was commentating or not, but um, I was certainly watching it and was surprised to see how that panned out. But uh, I remember definitely against Jabur, uh, watching that match, thinking, you know, Jabur's serve is decent, but she wasn't serving serve bot levels that day. But sometimes um, Garcia was barely getting a racket on her serve, and of course, because yeah. of the service position. But, you know, it's, it's also the same game that took her to the to winning the WTA finals in Fort Worth. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and she, and she obviously hopes and thinks that that's her best chance of winning a Grand Slam with that style. Yeah, for sure. I think she'll have other chances as well. I'm not, you know, I think she'll get more bites at the apple. She certainly will have her chances on grass, maybe at the U.S. Open again. But I just feel like this was a good opportunity for her to get herself in that semifinal again. And maybe this time she wouldn't have been, she would have started better than she did against Jabor. And that was really kind of a, you know, the nerves and the occasion really got to her. But I just, but in this one, I just feel like because her serve is so big, I mean, she had the most aces on the tour last year. Yeah. Uh, I think led the tour with more most aces, and you know had had really shown a consistent level for a good seven months. Like you can go all the way back to when she won the doubles, and the French Open. I think she won a title on every surface, won on grass, won the WTA finals, won Cincinnati from qualifying. You know, played extremely well to get to the semifinals of the U.S. Open. So I thought she was, uh, and she was looking good. Won all of her matches at the United Cup. So this was all mounting towards a good Australian Open. A, a deeper showing, but there's there's a funny typo here from Ghibli in the chat. He he writes about maybe she works needs to work on her mom aggressive, and I'm thinking has has, has she got an aggressive mother? But he meant he meant to say non non aggressive. So <laughs> um, I'll read it out in, uh, as he as he intended. Maybe she needs to work on her non aggressive game, but she hasn't got anywhere without being ultra aggressive. So I suspect it wouldn't work. Yeah. Yep, quite possibly there, Ghibli. Um, by the way, Ghibli, where are you today? I know you were somewhere uh, on a on a ski slope yesterday. He was he was um, I don't think he was watching the match yesterday with uh, 
Sitsi past Lehetska. Oh, by the way, we've got a break point here. So I think it's uh, it might yeah. be the second one, I think, um, for Shelton here at 30-40. Yep. And he goes down the T. Tommy Paul, forehand uh, from, is very loopy, that one, from uh, Tommy Paul. Backhand from Shelton, forehand Tommy Paul to the forehand of Shelton. Uh, now we're still on the forehand of Shelton and he goes long. No, he doesn't. He does go long, yeah. He must have, must yeah. have been super close. Juice. Yeah, you probably saw it on the, the video replay. It was just a little oh, long. Yeah. 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 Very close. Vanch, if I use centimeters and meters and kilometers per hour, and I think there was an oh, that's why I was using degrees Celsius as well. Are you are you all over that? You know where we're at with centimeters and Celsius? I think Celsius I'm I'm a lot better at. Uh, oh good. Because I can I can convert those in my head. But the um KPH sometimes I've, I struggle with <laughs> even now, even though I've watched so much tennis, I still struggle with the KPH versus MPH. Yeah. In the UK, we used we used to use both Celsius and Fahrenheit, but now I think we're just sticking with the Celsius. Yeah. Um, Tommy Paul holds. That's a big hold. Um, so he leads three two now. Uh, yeah. No, and I'm. Yeah, I, I'm okay. Not not. I mean, listen. I I used to be miles and and all that, but live in Germany now and, and UK is kind of, I think on the roads, you'll still see miles, but in school we're teaching centimeters and, and meters. So it's a bit of a hybrid, which on some, in some ways might be good, but in other ways might be very confusing. Um, yeah. we, we don't really do inches in, it's funny enough. We, we do miles when you, when you're driving, you see miles an hour and kilometers an hour on your clock. Do you have kilometers an hour on, an hour on, on the, on the, on the clock on your wheel on the, in the car? We do actually, but I never, it's never actually look at it. It is. <laughs> <laughs> that looks like Azarenka there warming up. She's obviously not in action today, but she was. What did you think about her win against Bagula yesterday? I was very, very pleasantly surprised. I, okay. I was not expecting uh, a 6 4 6 1 scoreline. Certainly not. No. Um, score, you know, scoreline a little deceiving. I didn't think it was that. It was a lot closer than that, I thought. Yeah. Uh, and the first set, I, from what I can, what I know, was very, very competitive. Uh, and I really thought there were, you know, Pagula was. I didn't think she was at her best, but she was certainly close to it. And Azarenka really stepped up and, you know, went up three love. And I think sort of really took some air out of that match for, for Pagula because Pagula has been more or less pretty much cruising in this tournament besides the first set against yeah. Krajikova, where yeah. she was really pushed. But uh, I thought Azarenka played such a smart match. Like I was watching the highlights. I mean, she was changing the trajectory of her shots quite a bit and very, very smartly, like looping some. You know, uh, you know, keeping others really, really low. She's got a great backhand herself. She can really redirect pace with it beautifully. She was serving better than she has in some moments the past year. And she just seemed really confident, like out there. She seems fitter than she was last year, for sure. And I thought Pagula was, her body language was a little bit surprising to me. She wasn't, she's usually, you know, a lot cooler and even keeled and looks composed, but confident out there. But I felt like she was just slugging the shoulders a little bit, just getting a little bit down on herself. Wasn't really quite the same. Maybe, maybe some, maybe the fact that it was a quarterfinal, maybe, and it wasn't Pagula or I mean, it wasn't Barty or Sviantek this time, and she felt like she was the heavy favorite going in. Maybe that added a little bit more expectations. I also thought maybe she was a little bit resigned in the second set. Maybe I'm being a little harsh, but I thought I certainly thought um, she's certainly not one to go away in these type of matches. So I thought indeed, uh, I, 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 there is a little bit of a pattern emerging regarding quarterfinals now and, and Pagula, but yeah. but I, I, I you know, five, I, right? Well, for five in quarterfinals and uh, just one that once set against was it Brady? It was Brady in 2021. Okay, uh, but since then, hasn't really won a set. Of course, there was that really tight one against Fiontek at the US Open where they had like five breaks each in the second set. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. Uh, the performance from Pagula wasn't that bad, and I'm not necessarily attributing it to any anxiety either. And I don't think Ghibli is here, but uh, I, I do think that she was she was showing a lot of signs of frustration, which she doesn't very often do, even in defeat. And uh, she was lamenting, I think, the court speed. Oh yeah, there's that because I think uh, she's played most of her matches in the day, and as Arinka played, and as Sydney, Arinka's I think. Quite quick where she was before, where okay, she demolished yeah, yeah, that's interesting. the Ontex. So yeah, I think, and also this was indoors, and when it was indoors and against Iga, the court was quite fast. I think it was a lot slower here, 
potentially, but I don't think she was using that as an excuse. But maybe no. she just had some trouble uh, getting used to the conditions, and it can happen in a match like that. Um, the funny thing about the Sydney one was, and I'm not talking about the conditions as such here, I'm talking about it from a, a TV viewing perspective as we see a, a break point for Tommy Paul, um, was that actually it's very difficult to tell uh, that the the Sydney one was indoors because there was so much daylight coming through the roof, if you like. Huh. Um, so it was quite, yeah. quite de- it was indoors, I think, but it was deceptively indoors, if you like. Anyway, we've got a break point here for uh, Tommy Paul, 30-40 on the Ben Shelton serve. Where are you going to go with this down the tee? But you're wide on the first serve. Uh, we see that excellent moment when it when it bounces and then you see it go fly up and then just appears on the TV screen. Anyway, uh, 30-40, second serve, Ben Shelton. Where How's your nerve? Not bad. It's in at least. And it's in and it's kicky enough to cause Paul problems and it's juice. Yeah. You really got to get that ball jump up on these courts, especially in the day because... Paul can take the backhand early and he's comfortable shortening his swing. He has a pretty compact one on the backhand. The forehand one is a little bit longer and sometimes can be a little bit wild, but he's been hitting some good forehands in this match, particularly to avoid getting broken in the last game. It, it, as uh, as Ghibli says here, it's uh, regarding De Menor, it's very difficult to know if a player is is nervy or or, or lacking confidence when they're just getting tanked it, it, or getting yeah. tonked. Sorry, it's you just. Don't, I mean, by the way, I could walk. I probably because I know I'm going to lose uh, without winning a point. I'd probably walk onto the court feeling fa- fairly relaxed playing Nova. I mean, I'd be very excited, of course, but but if I was even if it was just on on a court at my local, my aim would be to win a point. And over over two sets, because he's obviously winning in straight sets, I might win a point. I might do. And, and I know you're a higher level than me, Vanch, because you've um you obviously played a bit. Who is it? I, I always forget the guy's name who you played. Um, he was Emilio on Nava? Our... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So I, I I don't expect myself to win a game against you know any player in the top few hundred really. As Shelton puts the ball wide, it's a break for Tommy Paul four two. The first break of the match. Uh, it's a long way back right now for Ben Shelton, a set and a breakdown. Yeah, and maybe some of that is a carryover from not converting those two break points in the last game. Although Indeed. I don't think he did that much wrong. I mean, certainly no. that forehand was just a little bit long. But uh, yeah, he's had some maybe sort of half chances, if you'd like. But I think Paul has been a little bit more steady and probably deserves this set and break lead right now. My uh, philosophy, if I was to play any player in the top 200, but let's, as we're talking about Novak, we'll stick with him, would just be to hit every ball as hard and as close to the line as possible. I mean, these are the balls I'm getting a racket on, by the way, which, and, and by the way, he's, yeah. he's, I also think it's, there's an interesting point as well. Does he know how bad I am when we try to take to the court? Because if he doesn't, he could double fault on the first point. And then, <laughs> then you then then it's mission accomplished. Because if he doesn't know, if he knows, then he's just going to get every serve in basically, and uh, you're going to be in trouble. Therefore, but uh, if he has no idea, he could double fault on the first point. But I'm also redlining my returns uh, probably on the second serve, where I'm actually going to hopefully get a racket on it. Um, I may even have to try and anticipate as well a bit. And uh, yeah, and therefore, you know, you give me 50 serves, 25, let's say, 20 second serves. Yeah, I might do. I might get a point. I might get lucky. I might get a net cord um, a la Rublev or a la Andy Murray. By the way, we have, we've got a new expression on the show that, uh, that Jack was using. He said he loved Andy Murray's net cord approach. So <laughs> 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 he had a few lucky cords. What did you think of the Andy Murray run? Because I was when you were talking about the time zone, I was thinking to myself, you might well have gone to bed some nights and woken up and Andy Murray was still playing. Yeah, I was able to catch the match against Berrettini. Where he okay. won the where he won the first two sets and then he was he found himself in a war and then saved the match point and went on to win with that net court and uh, the super tie break and I thought oh wow you know beating Berrettini is uh, I I thought I, I thought he definitely would have had would have a great chance against Kokinakis and then I was not expecting uh, that comeback from that position I mean that was just absurd uh, the man just has such a big heart and such a big amount of fight and drive at this stage and physically as well. I think it really shows that he put in the work in the off season. And I, I know he didn't go all the way and he tired himself out and he couldn't, and he had to get uh, his, uh, I think it was blisters drained. So he didn't really sleep okay. very well after the 
Kokinakis match. I think he only slept for like three hours and that finished at the hands or on the, the feet, you know? On the feet. And it was okay. about eight of them. And he had to wake up and get them drained three hours later, oh, wow. which sounds disgusting. But yeah. um and, and the fact that he even won a set against RBA was so impressive. Yeah. Given uh, given that he I mean he was toast in the start of that match. Yeah. Really looked way out of it. And yeah. then he still managed to make that one of the most compelling matches of the tournament. And that was a four yeah. set loss. So yeah. I think he can still I think the the main thing is that he's physically a lot stronger than he was at, at times yeah. last year, and he's feeling better about his level. Uh, obviously, you know, had he put away Berrettini, maybe a little bit easier, maybe he would have had more left in that third round and potentially uh, pushed it to five or maybe even one. We'll never know. But I think uh, this is this is a good start, and he's now made the third round of I think three of the four majors post his hip injury, which okay. uh, you know I guess by his standards, I mean he wants way more than that. He was still disappointed after losing the match to RBA, but I think he can make a deep run at Wimbledon. I, I really believe that because, um, you know, regardless of whether he gets himself seated or not, um, I just think, you know, I mean, last year he came up against a red-hot John Isner who played one of the best matches of his life, but mm -hmm. with the right draw, I could easily see him in the fourth round or a quarterfinal. Yeah. And he could certainly yeah. push back for the for the top 30. I'm a lot more optimistic than I was last year. Last year didn't really give us Murray fans a whole lot of optimism. No. Apart from, you know, that, run in Stuttgart, I think, where he beat Tsitsipas and Kyrgios and really kind of put it together and was up. Uh, it was a one set all against Berrettini in that final. And you thought, okay, he can make a deep run at Wimbledon. By deep run, I mean second week. But um, but then uh, I, I think, think his preparation was just derailed because he, he had that abdominal injury and he had to pull out of Queens. Didn't really have a whole lot of momentum. I, I kind of agree, for, uh, actually, with Ghibli uh, in, the, in the chat here that maybe somebody like Ben Shelton, who has got a bit of character, I think he... Um... He could just do with a uh, like just geeing the crowd up. But the problem is Ghibli is he needs a moment to gee. So so Ghibli's in the yeah. in the chat here just saying you know get the and I agree. The thing is you need probably to break serve to do that. You need yeah. a, a, an incredible point going your way if you like one way or another. Uh, and it's there's not really the right. You can't just be ready to serve your second serve and, and start doing it. You know. Uh, but he does hold there reasonably comfortably uh, to love, which is nice. Just got a, a like on Facebook, so thank you for that. Uh, thanks, John. I can see your name popping up my screen. John, make sure you um, feel free to come and join us in the chat as well. If you comment below the video on Facebook, John, uh, and as long as it's not too crazy, I'll bring it up on the screen and, and react. But yeah, um, I agree with you. A, a kind draw, if you like. I mean, it's it, obviously that helps if you're seeded, but you know, you can be unseeded and get a, a, a get a wild card in the first round. You know, you might play Carl Edmund in the first round, and then suddenly you're, you know, hopefully from his perspective, you you've got a straight sets win. Uh, and on, on you go. But listen, uh, regarding his run here, I I saw the match against Berrettini. I saw how Berrettini played in the United Cup, and I thought that should be comfortable for Berrettini, maybe in four. Uh, I saw the match in New York last year where I thought it was going to be super competitive, and I know it went four sets, but really it felt like Berrettini was going to win all the way. And I think Berrettini coming into this tournament was in a much better situation, I felt, than he was going into to New York where he was sort of, had not played a great deal of tennis, certainly not fully fit tennis uh, last summer, uh, obviously having COVID at Wimbledon as well. Uh, and I thought he was going into this tournament in pretty good shape. And I had Berrettini, I think, going out to, to Fritz in the quarters in my in my bracket, but I was completely wrong with that. And even at two sets to love against Berrettini, once he gets back to two sets all, I think, wow, it's going to be Matteo in five. Matteo was looking fresh. He had a match point as well. Do you remember the match point he had? Yeah, he should have, he should have won that. But that's certainly one of those where... Um... On a, on a ball like that, he loves to go for the slice. He doesn't want to be creating from that really low position on that backhand, and that's exactly where Murray Murray had it. And yeah, absolutely, he might be having nightmares about that shot because he just had to get that over the net, and he he would have won it, pulled it off from two sets to love. I think yeah. now Murray has the most comebacks of anyone in the open era from two sets to love down. That's a great stat for him to have the record in. Um, Great, yeah, never, that is... you know he'll never have the other records that the big three have, but that's a really nice, unique yeah. stat that embodies. Are, are you a Murray, are you a Murray fan, Vanch? I am, and actually, the truth is that I wasn't one before twenty thirteen or twenty twelve. I just okay. didn't, uh, I just didn't really vibe with him very much. Okay. I felt like his on court demeanor was just not my type, you know. Uh -huh, I, I, uh -huh. just, uh, I couldn't really get behind his game. I was like, you know, how is he just defending like this, like a madman all day, like? You know, where's the exciting offense? I thought he was a bit boring off the court. I didn't understand him as a person. I really didn't. Uh -huh. And then I think when he won, when he won the U.S. Open, and when he won 
sort of the first half of 2013, that's when I really became a big fan of his. Because then I just I, I realized what a big heart he has and how much pressure was on his shoulder this whole time to win, really do it for his country and finally get over the line and win one of these things, beating Djokovic in the final. And, uh, and you know, that last game, I still think about that game all the time. That last game that he had against Djokovic to win 15-minute game. The one these, in New York you're talking about now? No, the one in the one in Wimbledon actually when he Oh Wimbledon, won, so, yeah, yeah. Uh yeah, in twenty thirteen, the Wimbledon final. <laughs> last yeah, game yeah. before he was forty love up. Man, that game will always stay with me. But ever since then I've 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 always sort of rooted for him. I like that he's the most human, potentially, mm-hmm. out of all the four. Um, because he just yeah, it's it, it's hard for him. It it doesn't come naturally. And he's He's not afraid to show his emotions and wear his heart on his sleeve. And I think that he really connects with you in that way. And I found that difficult to understand in the beginning. But once I got on board, I've been on board. Yeah. And I think I think uh, a lot of people, even in the UK, would agree with you regarding his demeanor and, and maybe how he came across. But um, there was a few things that I think occurred around that time that we started to realize there's a very dry sense of humor there's a picture of him. I think it's quite recent, actually, in the last three or four years. Yeah. There's a very funny picture of him at Christmas wearing a Christmas jumper with a very yeah. miserable-looking mince pie in front of him and him looking very down. And, and it, it's, it's just very funny. You know? yeah. I don't, do you know the picture I mean? I, I know which one you're talking about, yeah. yeah. It's, he, he's, got a great, he's got a great sense of humor. It's very dry and he's very witty and sort of... It, it kind of goes with his on-court game as well. Like he's he's got a good IQ and he's anticipates really well and he's able to do that with with jokes as well. But he tells them he really <laughs> it's it's one of those that just makes you laugh because it's so sarcastic and he he, he picks his moments well for these jokes. It might be a, a cookie rather than a mince pie. I'm just trying to find it right now. But uh, with the Christmas, jumper, I think it might have been a cookie actually. Yeah, yeah. It, it... yeah. <laughs> I'm looking. <laughs> I'm looking at it right now. Let's see if I can get it up on the screen. Um, but yes, Tommy Paul, by the way, uh, won um, comfortably uh, that set in the end, 6-3. Um, and Shelton will serve first uh, in this next set. I'm not sure if there's much that Shelton can do right now. I'm going to get this um, Andy Murray image up on the screen for us, I hope. Uh, just a second. But uh, yeah, I've got a few comments. Janie uh, is with us now. Andy has 11 wins from two sets down, apparently. That's the most in the open era. Yeah, right. Um, and there were some other comments there as well. Uh, what was we got? Um, this is too comfortable for Tommy. Yeah, it is looking pretty comfortable. Yeah, Shelton looks a bit gassed out. Yeah, may well be. Um, he has had a really yeah. tough road, actually, now that I think about it. Uh, a lot of close tie breaks. I think two five-setters in there as well. I think more just emotionally the highs of winning the, winning that match against Popper in, and then also the, the the match against Wolf was not easy either. Two sets to one down, lost a couple of tie breaks. Indeed, indeed. Here we go. Here's Andy. Oh, I'll get him up on the screen to give everyone a little bit of a smile. Uh, oh, there we there go. It is. Andy, yeah, with an empty plate. What but is he's got his plate actually? Say again. What is he? Do you know what's in the plate? Uh, it, it's actually empty. I think there oh, may okay, be some yeah, crumbs on there. Yeah, I think there could be a few crumbs on there. But uh, it looks like a British home to me as well, which I think just just uh, adds to the amusement. I think um, that was in oh, it was quite a while ago, twenty fourteen. So it's pre hip uh, operation anyway, long before the pre the hip operation. Okay, Shelton, is there any way back for him? Do you think? Um, I think he's got to he's got to just build up some scoreboard pressure, just keep a. Uh, Keep applying consistent depth on his shots. I mean, he, he's kind of looks a bit flat right now. Like doesn't really have a whole lot of energy. Might be just spent. Mm-hmm. So he, he's got to like just fire himself up. Just play with that swagger that he was before. He was still he still had that in the first set. And I think once he lost that tie break, he and once he didn't convert those break chances, he just looks a bit deflated. He's got to get mm-hmm. that energy back. But yeah. It won't be easy, but if he can get it into another tie break or he can hold here to start and not get broken right away in the third, he'll certainly have a chance or two when he's got to just take it. For those of you just tuning in, there was a really key moment in the first set, sorry, in the second set, where Shelton has a couple of break points. Doesn't take them, but I think really Tommy Paul saved them rather than that. 
And then the next game, Shelton is broken. And um, here we are, pretty much, two sets of love down. Um, by the way, so he's from Florida, is he, um, Shelton? Yep. Uh, I, I can see this comment from Ghibli, and I, and I get the the maths behind it, so to speak, or the logic behind it, but I don't think it's quite as simple as that. I mean, you might get an Aussie playing a guy from Finland, and you would think, oh, an Aussie's going to be, you know, it doesn't always work out that way that, that your body can handle the heat better. I mean, I saw Rafa really struggling, for example, a year ago against Chapo, and all sorts of factors, time on court, how many kilometers you've had to run, even that day and, and what you've been consuming, of course, can all factor in. And um, I mean, I know people from from Southern Europe that struggle more with the heat than I do, for example, and I'm from the UK and, and the other way around, you know. Um, so yeah. it's not always as simple as just, oh, he grew up in Florida, so therefore he should be used to it. Yeah, but I think training in Florida is certainly one of the best places because you get at least used to the humidity, which I think, uh, you know, come the Miami Open or even New York in the summer. And I mean, her catch, tournaments. her catch sort of, I don't I know he does a lot of training blocks out yeah. there. And I know he did so ahead of Indian Wells, I'm guessing. Was it Indian Wells or Miami he won? Oh, Miami. Miami he won, yeah. So, I mean, Miami, of course, is in, in Florida. Um, so that would make sense. But uh, yeah, I think it can make a difference. And a, a lot of us as well look at Americans in the US and, and Australians in Australia, but also, if you have a, if you have, you have a good training block there, I think that can help too. Yeah, I, I know that Andy certainly went to Florida, near that uh, Miami area, and trained there hard for two or three weeks this off season, and he felt a lot better about his physical condition. What do you think about this, Fanch? I'm a fan, although I don't think it'll happen because there's too many dollars at, at stake. I'm a fan of thinning the calendar a little bit. As in, like, let's say one Masters tournament less a year. Um, what else would I be a fan of? You know, one or two less team events. Not Maybe not less team events, but less frequent. I'd be a big fan of making the Labour Cup, for example, every two years. Um, I'd also yeah. be a fan of making the Davis Cup potentially every two years, for example, and so on. Or stretch it out over a two-year period. Just to, And, of course, one or two 250s and 500s. Just because I don't want to see... Uh, Al Alcaraz, who's 19 years old, going, do you know what? I'm not going to play Rome because I want to be better prepared for the French. I also don't want to see Alcaraz injured as often as it is perhaps he is. Holger Rune the same. And I, I just want to see the absolute best athletes in the world performing at their highest a bit more often, whether they be 35 or 36 like Rafa and Novak or whether they be 18, 19 like Holger and, and, uh, and Carlos. Yeah, um, I certainly would want... Longer off season, uh, I would want. Yeah. At least for the top players, I think end of October that should be it. Yeah. I don't need anything in November or December. Yeah. And and I think I I mean that's mostly for top players. You can still have challengers and ITFs and yep, all those tournaments happening in November and December. And yep. you certainly like I mean usually normally on the schedule we have what Shanghai and Paris Masters after the U.S. Open as for Masters mm -hmm. tournaments and then you have the World Tour Finals. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we've already gotten rid of Shanghai, but instead we've just replaced that with a lot of other 250s and 500s and a lot of other... And I think the whole Davis Cup thing, the timing of the year, yeah. it's just five or six weeks before the United Cup. It's a bit too much. Like, I definitely yeah. think if you have United Cup one year, you can have the Davis Cup every two years. It's very tricky because yeah. the Davis Cup has, like, the history. Yeah. But then the United Cup has the points, and obviously there's wackiness like we saw this year with the format and 18 teams instead of 16 and mm -hmm. you have all these scenarios and traveling and uh, jet lag and you have all these uh, you know still unfairnesses with the teams and the, the selections and I, th I thought it was just so much tennis to start the year like it was just yeah. a crazy amount where you had so many matches that weren't even top billing but they were just playing them anyway because they were playing five rubbers and the Yo. mixed doubles which was the main thing main reason why the United Cup, that was the main selling point, and that wasn't even the deciding match, which I uh, felt you're, like they could you're already so you're already seeing with, with the United Cup as well. Yeah, I agree, I agree with all of those comments. I mean, probably one thing, first of all, I don't know, oh, I think we touched on this before on a previous stream before, but yeah, having 18 and have 16 there, that would in that tournament alone, you'd have a couple of less uh matches and it would be a little bit more competitive and the maths would work better, but yeah, perhaps having three people on a team. 
Maybe playing around with when the doubles, if you do stick with five, have the doubles match as the third match, if you like. Um, you also already, we're already seeing in its first year, but it may get worse in latter years. You may see players just going, you know what, I think I'd rather play Adelaide 250 two weeks before because I might get more matches there or it might suit me better than, than playing the United Cup, where, of course, you've got to fly around a bit potentially as well. Um, playing in, in, in three different parts of Australia, potentially, or, or whatever. So, or a couple of parts. I don't know. I think there's a lot to work on. And yeah, but just back to my point initially, just a, a, a bit less tennis, in my opinion, would be um, would be certainly at the, the, the top level, as you say. I think keep up the challenge and stuff. I probably wouldn't go back as far as October. I don't mind it going into November a little bit. And I know people, uh, I'm waiting for someone in the chat to say, um, by the way, don't forget, you'll just get more people playing exhibitions and stuff. Maybe, maybe, but we already see Rafa and Novak being careful with their exhibitions and even players like Alcaraz who played um, in, uh, in an exhibition, he's using that as a, as a way to get back to fitness. Players, uh, I'm okay with that. It's almost like a friendly, in like if, if you want, in, in yeah. soccer uh, parlance. Um, but you may get back to the United Cup, you may get I think more. it depends on how you treat that exhibition. Like there were some exhibitions during the during the month of December where they were really going all out. It was like, you know, you had like top players like Sabalenka, Djokovic, Felix, all these other players, they were playing like that. They were playing that uh, flex league. And then they were playing, they were playing like, you know, all out sets. And like they have that Mobudala tournament that just pops up in the middle of December. Yeah. And then you have, I, I feel like if they're just going to put exhibitions, then the tours might just say, okay, why don't we just put it in a 250 or a 500 in, in December? And then, you know, you can, because you can't just like say, oh, the season is too long and then just play all these exhibitions. It just Agreed. doesn't add up, right? So it's like, Agreed. and then also like we've seen now that the players who did play, some of them, like for instance, Casper Ruud, I'm thinking is the main example. He didn't really have an off season because he went deep in O2 Arena then I mean it's not O2 anymore, but the Turin ATP know, finals, yeah, yeah. and then he he plays that ten day exhibition tour with Nadal, and yeah. then he goes to Mobudala, plays the exhibition there, yeah. has like maybe three or four days off, goes to the Maldives for about five or six days. That's like vacation. That's not really preparing for the next season, mm -hmm. and then he's already playing United Cup and potentially Auckland, and then getting ready for the Australian Open. And he had, basically had no preseason, yeah, and so he wasn't really able to. And, you know, maybe that was a factor. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe Brooksby was just playing a very smart match. But, mm -hmm. you know, it certainly is not ideal to go into the new season like that. So players are just going to then use February for their off season and keep Australian Open like an extension. But it certainly didn't work for some players this time around. It so I wonder if they'll rethink that. Yeah, it didn't. I, I, I think... I was surprised when I saw that 10-day uh, that tour that him and Rafa had uh, when it was announced, uh, I guess sometime in around about August, September, that was announced. I was surprised at that, thinking that's going to uh, impact on their off season. Um, but I think, as you say, I think then both players, even Rafa included, uh, saw February as, as as a time off. Although, having said that, I think Rafa had signed up for for Dubai. Although I think he's now pulled out, or he will pull out because of the injury he picked up. But. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 but I mean, I know what you're saying, and but I do think that that the the, the exhibitions by Casper Ruud aside are used. Yeah, and, and and for Casper Ruud, I mean, that was a good opportunity. So like that that exhibition with Nadal, I don't think I'm criticizing him that much for it because, you know, it's Rafa. You don't know how long he's going to play. Rafa's his idol. Obviously, he's doing a they're doing a noble thing by bringing tennis to a different part of the world that doesn't get enough. So, you know, it's one of those, like, you just take that opportunity. I don't think you'll have many regrets about that. Um, Shelton's facing a break point here, 30-40 mm -hmm. on his serve. Uh, two sets to love down. Shelton but you were, you were going to say something, so you can... Yeah, I was, and I will finish that in a second. Uh, but uh, um, just quickly here, we've got Shelton here, 30-40, one game all. Gets his second serve in. It's a very, very good second serve. Not enough to win the point, though, because... um. Yeah, there we go. Sometimes it doesn't make the point. Okay, here we go. Shelton, the forehand. Backhand, Tommy Paul. Forehand, Shelton. Forehand slice from Tommy Hall. Not bad defense there from the from Tommy. And he's gone wide with that one. So it's deuce. What I would say is um, on this is that you've got various different people at various different points in their 
in their tellers tennis calendar like i say alcaraz i'm thinking particularly in that um is, is it doha is it whatever you call it abu uh, mubad um yeah. tournament so in doha you've got two or three different places that two or three people might be in. You've got Kasparud, where he was at in his schedule. You've got players like uh, Alcaraz, which is just using it as as, as um, Nadal did a year before, coming back from an injury. Don't forget Alcaraz got injured in Paris Bercy before his most recent injury that put him out of the Aussie Open. But of course, Nadal had barely played in six months, so he's using it for that purpose the year before and using it very effectively. Just got to get the charger for my laptop. But also, you've then got someone like Tsitsipas, who is really using that tournament in Doha, and I think there may have been another one, using it as a run-up. And now, we, we are now running up to the Australian Open, and I am not at the same level as I will be at the United Cup, but this is this is really, me really much further along my process than Alcaraz was this year or Nadal was a year before. So you've got different people using that. And I, I don't, of course, I also get the idea that there's a lot of money behind all this as well. And without that, they might not. But I actually think, I think for someone like Tsitsipas and Alcaraz, who we just touched upon, there's good reasons for them to play that. So it's a nice, a nice springboard towards then the real action at the United Cup. And then, of course, the real, real action in Melbourne. And, and I think yeah. that's a nice two tournament build up if you like um towards that and and so i don't think i but i don't think you might have more exhibitions going on but i don't think city pass would play another exhibition before that if you like i don't think casper yeah. rude would play another one i don't think maybe alcaraz would play another one despite the dollars that are on offer because the top 10 players just really are still very much focused on on winning majors and, and putting themselves in the best position to do so yep so I, I just think that even if you thin it out, if you do thin out the calendar, as we go back to Juice here, Shelton did have a game point there. Um, I do think if you thin out the calendar, uh, it would have some of the desired effect. You'll still have some of these exhibitions going on. You'll be going, what are they? We're trying to thin out the calendar here, but they will, the top 10 will be using those exhibitions for the right reasons, mostly, yeah. with the exception well, of maybe... They can go against themselves, I think. Yeah. Yeah, but um, but I, I would I would rather they didn't pace themselves during the season as they have to yeah. do right now. Um, yeah, I would, that's the thing. Um, I, I would upset I people. See more swings, you know, like we have the Australian swing and then we have like the swing in South America. But then it's like, why are we going to clay when we have yeah. you know the we have Indian Wells in Miami coming up, and then we have like certain tournaments in indoors. And then we have clay like again after Wimbledon, so it's a little strange, like how we. Just I don't know how it would that. work with the weather, but maybe we could bring the sunshine double, um, just alter it by a week or something like that, and just bring it a bit yeah. closer to the Aussie Open, maybe by a week. I'm also a fan of putting another week between um, the French Open and uh, Wimbledon. And Wimbledon, yeah, I yeah. think that would help a lot. Yeah, and so we that, have, and that we, is we that is weeks. aided. That is aided yeah, by fitting the schedule. I think another week would be nice. I mean, if we could get a Masters 1000 on grass. If we could, a... yeah. But I'm actually fine with not. I mean, I agree if we could, great. But I'm also okay with not. I think that, that Haller and, and Queens especially. Uh, I say Queens especially, not because I'm a Brit, but actually uh, I wonder if we're going to see more and more players play Queens and, and less play Haller. Just looking at some of the stats, Roger Federer aside, you play Haller, yeah. you don't do well at Wimbledon. You play Queens, you do well at Wimbledon. Huh, yeah, the, those courts and queens are much more similar, I think, in the nature of the bounce and the grass is greener and it's a little bit different. Although this year, I think the queen's uh, field was a lot weaker than the Halle one, which is strange. I, yeah. Sometimes it just goes both ways. Sometimes, good. like, I think Halle does a good job of, like, giving players really good contracts and appearance okay. fees. And then, then that kind of helps the draw get a little bit more stacked. And sometimes queens, maybe not as... But it, it, it kind of varies. Like before, Queens was stacked, and Halle was the one that didn't have most top 10 players. And last couple of years, I think that's changed now. Shelton saves a break point uh, with an ace. That's his third break point he's faced in this game with a 215 kilometer an hour serve. I'm going to guess, I'm going to say 215 kilometers an hour is 135 miles an hour. Let's have a quick look. 215. You're very close. I think that was a 134. You're right. Oh, on the wow. <laughs> Wow, so there you go. One, two, uh, uh, let's have a quick look. Yeah, 
Yeah, one thirty. Well, one thirty three point six. But yeah, yeah, oh, that was a bit lucky. Yeah. Um, oh, that's not lucky though. That's excellent from Tommy Paul there with a nice yeah. little dink at the net that I was suggesting maybe he could have done. Um, I think it was in the first set or maybe the second. Yeah, he has a great so, especially on the run, he can really dig out these type of shots, and he stays so low when he does it. It's quite good to watch. He's got really good hands. Yep, indeed he has, and he showed them to full effect there, and he's brought up another break point here, his fourth one of the game. Shelton there on the first serve, I don't know if that clipped the net or if it went long, but anyway, here we go. Break point number four, Tommy Shelton serving. Tommy Shelton? <laughs> <laughs> he saves it there with an unreturnable, uh, Ben Shelton does. So it's Deuce again, sixth one of the game. Mixing up the names. If I mix up the nationalities, it's no problem in this one, but mixing up the names can be costly. There must be some chat I'm missing out on here because I think we're talk they're talking about doubles now in the chat. Uh, anyway, I I'd love to see a, a, a 1,000 and get rid of Monte Carlo, uh, but we all know why that won't happen. Yes, I, I think we do. Um, I I by the way, I know what's going to say. I'm going to upset the people of, of North America and in particular Cincinnati. That would be the one that I would lose if because I I'm trying to, look trying to thin out the calendar. I don't know if we need two 1,000s happening back to back. Uh, I, I like the sunshine double thing. It's it's a thing in tennis, so that's kind of nice. Yeah. And I, don't I don't want to mess with it. India Wells in Miami. I like no, of that course thing not. Of lot. course not. I get that. Um, I like the views from the TV that I see of Monte Carlo. Yeah. But yes, we do have three one thousands on clay in the build up to to um, to and then I guess if you uh, listen, it, a lot of these things, as Ghibli suggests, won't happen. But if you were, to I think lose it will probably Carlo, be the one at the end of the year for me. Like, I think if we get rid of either one of Shanghai or Paris permanently. Yeah. Well, Shanghai pretty much has for now gone. Yeah. Just looking at Donna Vekic in her co uh, press conference, looking pretty down um, after that um, quarterfinal. I like the idea of having eight Masters 1000s. I don't know who came up with nine. Okay. Yeah. Like, that, that, let's, like an odd yeah. <laughs> yeah. We could. I mean, the thing is, Paris Bercy, yeah. I mean, we've 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 got we've lost Shanghai for now anyway. So yeah. are we at eight without Shanghai? I actually really like the Shanghai tournament. It's just that it's a really horrible time zone, so I could never actually watch it. Yeah. Um. um but as I say, I would I would I'd be fine with six. Yeah. To be honest, I'd be fine with six Masters one thousands, um, mm. four slams. Uh, sunshine double. Also, of course, if we were to lose Monte Carlo, it might be able to give us a chance to go to Latin America for a clay court swing uh, of some sort. As, as, as mm. a, if we got the sunshine double a week before, maybe, and then after that, we followed it up with some tournaments in Latin America. Then we came to Europe. Actually, maybe, uh, yeah. maybe take out one of the ones on clay and add one on grass instead. <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing, the thing though, is uh, Monte Carlo is Monte Carlo and Rome are the ones that are the most similar to Roland Garros in terms of how they I mean, play. Could, I, I, I'd be listen again. This is not going to happen, and and, and, is, and I love Madrid as a city, but I, 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 I wouldn't. Too. Yeah, but um, you know, if we three three clay court one thousands, uh, but then I guess many people will say, well, you've only got one slam on clay, so we have three three one thousands perhaps, yeah. but um. Argentina should have a Masters. I mean, Jane wants Jane wants a 1,000 on grass. She wants a Masters in Argentina. I think you're increasing <laughs> the calendar, Jane. You're not reducing it. <laughs> but as, as Ghibli says, that was a big hold there from Shelton, bearing in mind how many break yeah. points uh, he held. And I think the thing is as well with, with the US having... Uh, that's two two games all by the way the u.s has uh, the sunshine double so that's why i was thinking let's lose cincinnati um mm. i mean i know the u.s is a huge country i, I get that but um i was just thinking maybe and and, and keep because i don't want canada to, to lose its 1000 because it only has one big big tournament a year anyway so that's why i was keeping canada over cincinnati um yeah yeah, I, I would probably, if it, it, as you said, Ghibli, it's not going to happen because of money. But, but um, yeah, I, I'd be if we lost Monte Carlo, maybe, and um, um, and um, and Cincinnati could add a one thousand on grass. But I'm okay with having a a, a couple of five hundred as we have now. 
uh, put another week between Wimbledon and Paris. Um, have a clay court swing to follow in Latin America following the Sunshine Double. Trying to end the season by early or mid-November at the latest. I mean, it does kind of end mid-November, but but possibly end of November with Davis Cup. But if we make Davis Cup every two years. Anyway, there we go. Back to the tennis. Two games all, Ben Shelton serving. Um, he was under pressure hugely on his serve last time around. I can see this being straight sets, though, I have to say. Maybe I do have time. an interesting question I wanted to ask you, cool. John, and get your take on it. Yeah. But... Uh, and that's about Rafa. Oh, I was okay. curious what you thought of his tournament as a whole and sort of where his career is headed and if you think he's very close to the end or if, what you make of those rumors. Sure, sure. Uh, a lot to unpack, and I'll do my best to do so without um, getting too distracted. Um, I was concerned even uh, during the indoor season uh, not about him retiring, but just about the way he was playing uh, during Paris Bercy and um, the ATP Tour Finals. Many mm -hmm. people that will want to come to his defense, if you like, in terms of that, will say, they'll say two things. First of all, his indoor record is not great. He's only won one tournament, but he does okay. He's still, you know, top five, top 10 players in the world pretty much his entire career on that surface. Uh, and in those conditions, and sometimes even better, I think circumstances sometimes got in his way from winning a, uh, a, a more indoor tournaments. I'm thinking in particular ATP Tour Finals, where he just ran into certain players um, at incredible moments, or he goes out in the group stage despite winning two matches, or he was serving for the match against Medvedev. That may well have turned out to be his last chance. So I was a bit more concerned about his form in... Mm -hmm. um, in those in that period then some people uh, i'm pretty sure owen is amongst these and, and certain others and maybe yourself actually yeah but an indoor hard blah 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 and i was like well yeah but he's he's losing to players that are not he's not losing to novak he's not losing to peak federer he's not losing to andy murray world number one and he's also losing in you know he's tiring in the third set i know you touched on that bench a month or so ago or he's losing you know, straight sets to Fritz and and and, Fe uh, and Felix and stuff, so on. So I was a bit concerned there. Mm -hmm. Those concerns were not allayed by his two performances at the beginning of this year against Cam Norrie, who did play very well, uh, admittedly, uh, and then Alex Dimonor in three sets. However, I did then think, well, we'll go into Australia. The draw was tough. Uh, the, the Draper match was difficult to gather. I got him in the first set there, playing probably his best set of tennis in six months. Uh, yeah. in that first set against Draper. Then um, he comes up in, in, uh, uh, in that match with McDonald. Uh, coming to your broader question about where we're at with his career, I don't know, and I don't think Rafa knows. I think Rafa, mm -hmm. at two or three points in the last few years, has maybe thought the end is in sight. I think as, as recently as, as, as Paris last year, yeah. didn't know if that would be. Going into the Australian Open last year, he said in his victory speech, he said he came into the tournament thinking this might be might well be his last Melbourne tournament at uh, the Australian Open. But he said in his victory speech, I'll be back next year. Going into the final of Roland Garros, there were rumours swirling online about him retiring and maybe even doing so in his speech afterwards. Um, that didn't happen. He gave his victory speech. And I think the, the, the treatment he had on his foot... I think it's called ablation uh, uh, yeah. uh, treatment. He had seemed to do the seemed to do the trick remarkably well, to the extent that I wonder why he didn't do it a year before when he was having all those troubles in in Washington. Anyway, now what we are having in the last six months with his with his injuries, they are sort of shortish injuries, which may be related to his age. Uh, you know, that we're looking at four to six weeks with each of these injuries that he's been picking up over the last 12 months that have hindered him or made him pull out of matches, etc. Whether it be the ribs, whether it be the abs or, or now with the hip, I think it is on this occasion. I don't really know if I've completely answered your question, but if I if you had to say, will I will we see him in 2024 percentages? Yes, I, I would say so. And but I think Rafa doesn't know. So it's really difficult yeah. to answer. I think it depends on how the clay court season goes. I think he yeah. probably should not come back until Monte Carlo. Agree. And then just, you know, go through the entire swing and just see, take it a match at a time, see how Monte Carlo 
Barcelona, Madrid, Rome, all these tournaments go. And then I think if he wins Paris, he's not going to want to retire at that point. No, no way. He's going to want to keep it going and, you know, see how far it can take him. But I yeah. was surprised that he even played the indoor season last year because, you know, he just had a he just had his baby. He had had the the he had the abdominal injury. He had, you know, just he had just watched Federer retire, and I just thought, mm-hmm. you know, maybe maybe he was just, you know, trying to get some momentum, trying to get back to the life on tour and just play some matches. But I, th- I wonder what would have happened in Australia had he not played. Paris and first and uh, maybe just I do think that Rafa knows his body well enough as well by now that he yeah. must have been feeling really good because we know I know that he probably played on maybe rushed things a bit with Wimbledon but especially the US Open basically if that was the indoor season uh, in September, if you like, or if that was how he was feeling going into the indoor, he would not have played the indoor season. Do you know, I'm, I'm talking about he. I think he. He was keen to play Canada, pulled out of that relatively late on, apologized for it. I think they'd even sent him some balls over from um, from uh, Montreal to practice with, which he was using in Manacor. Um, mm. But then he pulls out of that. Okay, that makes sense. He's, he's obviously had the ab injury that he had at Wimbledon. Didn't um, he re-aggravate the ab a week did. before the tournament? He did, and that's exactly what I'm saying. So I'm telling you now, if that was not a major happening in September last year. We wouldn't yeah. have seen him in probably until about October, November. Yeah, exactly. But therefore, go, he would not have been feeling in a similar condition. I don't think he was rushing back for that indoor mm-hmm. season. I think he just he just felt great. He just felt yeah. like, at least physically, he felt good. And he felt yeah. like, maybe have a couple of competitive matches. You never know how far I might go. You know, he beats Tommy. He, he was looking good for a set and a half against Tommy Paul in Paris, Bercy. You know, another couple of matches there, blah, blah, blah. So I, I just, I, I know exactly what you mean. I know that Gil Gross, for example, was saying he didn't think he'd see him in the indoor season. I just don't think if he feels great, then 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 he wants to play. But yeah. we, we also remember what Federer did in 2016 and took off that second half of the season, basically, to prepare himself for 2017. And, and he reaped the rewards for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, at the, I mean, at the time, I... I I I like that he was playing Paris and London. And I thought, you know, why not? If he's healthy, why not give it a go? But now that I'm looking, yeah. now that I'm sort of just looking back at it through that lens, I'm like, hmm, yeah, maybe, maybe. But then I also understand, you know, maybe there was a there was also a chance for number one. I know he doesn't yeah. really care that much about rankings and all that at this point in his career, mm-hmm. but you know, he was certainly in with a chance, and he had played, he had had a very good first half of the year. And you, you're, you know, you're right. If he beats Tommy Paul there, you never know. Maybe he goes to the quarters, semis. Maybe he wins one more match at the ATP finals. Yeah. You know, he did end his season with a win. Granted, it was a dead rubber, but... Yeah, and I, I thought that was a little bit important for both players in a way. I thought it's still Kasper Ruud showing his limitations, and I thought it was quite an important win for, for Rafa. But anyway, um, back to the match here. Three all, so we're pretty tense in terms of where we're at with this match. Bearing in mind, uh, Tommy Paul won the first two sets. Uh, we've got a smash here for... Oh, did Ooh. you see that smash? Yes, I did. From Shelton. Basically, a, a horrible, horrible smash um, in all yeah. senses. It was a tricky one. It was lofted up really high. I do think there's a... The, the, the longer you wait for the ball to fall, the more the anxiety and the concentration is important. And he, and he, he completely mishit it, and it goes long. So it's a break point again for Tommy Paul. I say again, and... I'm guessing Ghibli's slightly ahead of me because uh, he suggested there's a break here. And I'm guessing you've seen it too. Uh, Yeah, he goes into the net on the backhand side again. Again. Uh, Yeah, it's that same shot again. Yeah. It's the same shot that cost him in the tie break at the end of the first set. Uh, We've seen a few backhands into the net. And uh, Tommy Paul leads 4-3 with a break. Uh, Ghibli suggesting game over, quite possibly. I I, I must say that the first set, to some extent, but the second set especially, Made it feel that way. Mind you, I've seen so many tennis matches before where I thought game over and um, ended up being very, very different and none more so than in Melbourne in that final a year ago. Yeah. Oh, well, there's some fun and games going on back uh, outside there. Well, I've got a couple of, don't know if you're looking at the same thing. I've seen a couple of people dressed up in uh, in bird outfits, penguin outfits. Oh, yeah. Like. Um, they were showing that in the previous. Uh... 
Yeah. They must be pretty hot. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but Ghibli there suggesting game over. Yeah, I, I, it would be very, very difficult to imagine a, a, a Shelton win from here. Um, and Tommy Paul looks like he's headed towards the semi final where he'll play Andre Rublev or Novak Djokovic. Um, yeah, it has been a bit flat. Uh, I agree. Uh, Ghibli, it's been a bit, that's what we've been talking about. So many other things. I see uh, Andre Rublev here warming up. Um, he's going to have to bring his A game and just hope that Novak has an off day. See how that pans out. I don't know. I've got a decision to make. Shall I go to the gym or not? Mm, I'm feeling very lazy. Are you a gym guy, um, Vanch? I try to go at least two or three times a week, but uh, I haven't been, been since the Aussie Open started. Yeah, recently <laughs> I haven't been very good about it either. Fifteen love, Tommy Paul. Uh, four hand oh. wins in this set. Just one from Shelton. Indeed, Ghibli. We did touch on it, I think, probably in the first set, um, probably before you joined us, we were talking about that uh, that matchup, but at least uh, him having one of their three wins uh, recently. Uh, but the problem is I also saw their match in um, in Turin, but maybe I'm I'm forgetting just how close that first set was. As, as you said, Vanch, he did sort of lose his cool about, I think it was about Deuce and 4 all or something like that. And uh, and he just had a meltdown and ended up losing that first set and and then I think he lost the second set maybe six one. Yeah. Yeah, he certainly can't afford to have that kind of meltdown and loss of concentration today, especially if Novak plays like he has done in the last round or so. Even against Dimitrov, I thought Novak looked pretty good actually. To be honest with you. Yeah, he did. Um, yeah, that was a classic Djokovic Dimitrov match. That one. Yeah. I mean, he, he had one or two. I mean, I think Dimitrov goes down a break in the first set. He does get it back on serve, but... Yeah, he had a couple of set points, but they were saved rather easily. On the Novak serve, yeah. And again, typical sort of Novak. I think there were some clutch serves in those moments. Um, yeah, maybe. Maybe the long... I mean, listen, listen, he's not been pushed really as yet. It's not like he's gone five sets. It's not like he's gone four tough sets. It's not like he's been pushed left, right and centre around the court and uh, does Rublev though have that variety to to pull him left, right, and centre around the court? It's not like he's playing Alcaraz, who's doing drop shots and then blasting winners past him, etc. Yeah, Alcaraz, I think, has been missed at this tournament, uh, in my opinion, especially yeah, as players I, you like know, Medvedev. I was trying to Nova. pinpoint. I was trying to pinpoint what exactly it is when you ask that question. About, uh -huh. uh, you know, like, or you made the comment about this tournament just being a little bit, you know, maybe compared to last year or the year before, not being as exciting in terms of, you know, maybe standout matches. I mean, obviously, you yeah. had the Murray matches and you had, you know, you had the Sitsipas Center match, which was, I mm -hmm. wouldn't really call that a classic, but it was, you know, a good one. It was yeah. just good, but nothing yeah. really that much more. And I think we had a lot more last year. I mean, you, you obviously had the Rafa run, you had, the Felix Medvedev match, you had the Fritz Sitsipas. I mean, you had some like good men's matches that were memorable. Yeah. But this tournament, and I was trying to pinpoint what exactly it is that was missing. And I think I think Alcaraz is a big part of that question. I do too. And especially if we had him on the opposite side of the draw to, to Novak, or even if he's on the same side and they were on a, a semi-final collision yeah. course, you know, you'd be Pretty you'd be looking anywhere. at that. And you'd be, uh, yeah. whether you're a Carlos or Novak fan, there'd be a large part of you as a neutral just thinking, oh, I do hope they both get to the final. Now, I know Carlos Wait, is... Cold. Shelton just broke back? Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I missed this. I, 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 what, what actually happened on breakpoint? I, I missed that entirely so far. I was busy thinking about uh, Alcaraz there. And, yeah, same. Yeah. And, and it was such, such a, the thing is this match has been a bit, yeah, a bit flat as people said. So I switched off. And so Shelton's broke back. I was just writing off, not just, um, not just this set, but of course the match. And, uh, here we go. We're back on serve 15 love Tommy, uh, uh, uh love 15. I should say, look, I'm, I'm all flustered now. Is that a double yeah, fault? Someone Shelton, let us know in the comments well. what happened on the break point. <laughs> <laughs> It's because uh, this, I was watching that maybe Novak's hamstring. I was thinking, hang on, we've got a new yeah. comment. This tournament needs Steph to take down Novak in a five-set final with a top display to make it memorable. Paul was um, 
Paul was useless to get broken, is what Ghibli suggests. And that's that's <laughs> all the insight we can give you on talking tennis right now. We just got a we just got a like on Facebook. I, I'm not quite sure why, but um, <laughs> but we did. And it is 15:30 because uh Tommy Paul fails with a passing shot there. Uh four all in this set, but uh it was a break to the good for Tommy Paul. He was four three up. They had a changeover, of course, at four three. Um, yeah. I started to relax, thinking this game's this game set and much, and then uh, I probably still wouldn't have even maybe barely noticed if you went and said, "Hang on a second. It probably was to f probably to probably without dropping a point as well. Anyone in the live chat, if you want to uh, tell us exactly how <laughs> Ben Shelton managed to get on back on serve, let us know. Let's see how this point turns out though, because he might get broken again yet. We'll see. Backhand from Tommy Paul, forehand into the net. This time it's on the forehand side, and we've got two break points for Tommy Paul. So this 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 match game on again might be short lived. We'll see. Yeah, I just think that Carlos was maybe a little bit uh, off form and off color after New York, and obviously picking up the injury in in um, in uh, in Paris Bercy. So there's no guarantees that he would have played this tournament and set the tournament alight in so many ways like he did in New York. But there would have been that hope. And yeah. the further he went in the tournament, the more you'd be thinking, hang on a second, him and Novak in the final will be pretty tasty. Yeah. And my understanding was he had recovered from the ab injury and he was he hurt himself in practice trying to chase a ball. Yeah. Yeah. But was it the ab again he he, he agitated? I think it was the leg this time. Ah, yes, right? a leg injury. Yeah, yeah. True. So, yeah, completely different injury. But it looks like he's back on the court again. He'll be back soon yeah. playing in the South American clay. And by the way, an excellent second serve there from Shelton saves the second break points to that back at juice. But yeah, it's 205 kilometers an hour, that second serve. So he wasn't um, wasn't holding back on that one. Uh, yes, in terms of that, which just goes to show that it was probably touch and go for Australia. And, um, you know, a mature decision, you may say, to, to not play. It may have been more black and white than that. But the fact that he's going to be back yeah. as early as as the next couple of weeks, I think, to play in South America. Yeah, so no, I, I think I agree with your sentiment. I mean, Alcaraz not being there, you know, Nadal obviously having the injury, Medvedev not the same Medvedev from a year ago. Yeah. You know, team not quite back yet, not even no. close. And so the biggest sort of obstacles for, for Novak uh, in the way of making a final, and a nice ace there from Shelton to save another break point, um, the biggest obstacles in, in, in Novak's way of making a final have been, and I, I read these off, uh, Dimitrov, Dimonor, uh, Rublev, and uh, probably Tommy Paul. Yep. You're thinking, hmm, well, you know, that's not bad. Yeah. For Novak, in, ter in terms of there being intrigue, if it's Holger Rune in this quarterfinal today, I think we're pretty pumped. We're still, I would still tip Novak over five sets, of course. But I'm thinking, mm. boy, oh boy, we all remember what happened in Paris, Bercy. Rune can certainly upset him in in in, in, t in tennis terms, at least. We remember him taking the first set. It's a big hold there from Shelton, five four. Yeah. We remember the first set that I think Holger Rune won in New York um, eighteen months ago as well. So. Yeah. You know, there's 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 plenty to get excited about, and there's plenty of people perhaps predicting a a Holger Rune win, if you like, and uh, and I would certainly not think that there was anything guaranteed about that. But with Rune going out, Rublev going through, Korda as well going out, in my opinion, on the other side. Um, Sitsi pass, by the way, I don't know if you did you did you see any of the Sitsi pass Lehetska game? I'm get match. I'm guessing no. I wasn't able to catch it, but I did see some highlights that the Australian Open put up. The, the good thing was, is the Australian Open has been putting up these eight-minute highlights, which are okay. much better than the other majors where it's like three or four okay. minutes and a lot of that is yeah, just yeah. intro music. Uh, the the match itself, and I probably the highlights won't do it justice, um, bearing yeah. in mind they are called highlights, is it was pretty poor. It was a pretty poor level from both sides of the net. I mean, mm. I think somebody joined me in the live chat and said, how's, how's Steph's backhand looking? And I was like, not great. In fact, pretty yeah. bad um there was only a couple of breaks of serve he was really good in the i think it was the first no second set tie break he was really yeah. good in the tie break but that aside it was a very scratchy display in my opinion and was mm. aided and abetted by the fact that lehetzka's level was was probably a notch or two below what he'd shown before as a result 
We had a, a not great performance either side of the net. Sitsipas goes through in three sets, and you look at the you look at the black and white stats, and you go, "Oh, okay, Sitsipas is looking good." But I'm telling you, if he plays anything like that, even against Hatchinov, he's he might have a few problems. But never mind, Novak. Hmm. But, That's interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, because everyone's been throwing around these stats about the breakpoint save, but I guess if that's Novak, I mean, he's he's all over that. Yeah, There's no yeah. way he's saving those breakpoints against Djokovic. Yeah, he saved five, I think, in one game today against, uh, I say today, it was yesterday, actually, yeah. in, in, uh, uh, against Lehetska. But um, I'm telling you, he had a bad day at the office, Steph. I mean, so many times I was, you, you, I, the, the backhand is always there, as is the return, of course. But there were so many times today you're just thinking Lehetska was so here's here's an example. Lehetska was finding the backhand. That can sometimes be a problem, especially on clay, I think. Um, but he was finding the backhand and the backhand was breaking down, yeah. but the scoreboard wasn't representing it because Lehetska couldn't take his chances in that game when he had five break points. On top of that, there was only two breaks of serve, I think, in the whole match. Um, and that was it, really. Um, yeah, not much to say. That, that listen. I've seen Novak play badly and win a Grand Slam playing badly for large parts of it. And, and same with Rafa as well and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and that's an example of some of these greats of being just how great they are, that they can they can get to Grand Slam finals and and not play that well. And that's something that players like Tsitsipas and and uh, perhaps Dominic Team and Daniel Medvedev don't quite have that luxury of doing. But so on that side, but the thing is, Stefanos doesn't have that history behind him of, you know, half a dozen Grand Slam finals, couple of wins, etc. He doesn't have that level. We don't. We have. It's not like he's played badly before and got to Grand Slam finals. He's normally had to produce his best tennis. Mm. Anyway, yeah. Well, that's good for him though. As a result, to get to, I think now that's four of the last five years he's gone yeah. to a semi. So that's it's good. But yeah, uh, and I think he has a five-zero head-to-head against Hatchinov. He does. He does. So that does bode well for him. Yeah. Uh, although Hachinov has been playing a lot better, you know, last two majors he's now made semis, and he will have to play a lot better. It sounds like against against Hachinov, who who's not going to go away like Lehechka was. But Lehechka had a very good tournament as well, beating Nori Chorich, Chorich in the first round. Oh um, yeah, that's easily forgotten. Yeah. Yeah, I I had picked Lehechka to get to round three, I think, and then lose to Nori. I think that one impressed me the most because I mean he was down two sets to one, and I thought he. Nori had just beaten him in Auckland, I think, on the way to the final. Yeah. And I thought, okay, yeah, I mean, Nori's just going to be too steady. But this guy hits a big ball off both wings, and he's gotten fitter in the offseason, and he likes to come to the net. Um, and he's, yeah, he's got a pretty good combinations uh, offensively. Yep, I agree. Uh, he, uh, he had a great build-up to the tournament. And um, I just think that regarding Lehetska, didn't he have another big win? I think, oh yeah, that was against Zverev at the United Cup. It's Zverev straight sets, yeah. a really easy straight sets. Yeah. I'm not sure if it was two and three or something like that at the United Cup, yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm probably being a bit bigger on the on the Pass analysis and takedown than Lehetska, just because Lehetska is the first time, I think, for him to reach this stage of a, of a major. And I yeah. think that perhaps you could look at Lehetska and his run, particularly the, the matches against Norrie or the match against Nori. Uh, which had lots of breaks of serve and probably took a lot out of both players in, in semi, semi respects. Of course, Noe going out, so it's not so important in terms of how much it took out of him. But then, of course, playing Felix as well, that maybe today was just mentally and physically a step too far for, for Lehetska. So I'm, I'm probably more yeah. focused on, on Sitsipas than the other way around. Makes sense. Because actually, I think before the match, um, that was a pretty bad first serve there from Ben Ben Shelton. Um, before the match, I thought it could easily go three, four, five sets. You know, um, uh, I still had City Pass to win, but I thought it would be pretty close. So, as I say, just looking at the scoreboard, you go, "Well, that's a pretty good win to beat Lehetska in straight sets." But um, uh, I think neither brought their their A level yeah. today, and um, I think if Lehetska had done so, uh, he may well have. Well, in fact, I'm sure he would have pushed things a lot closer. Uh, Shelton there, 40 love, and it's game to love, so it's six games to five. Very different feel to this match. Well, not very different feel. A different feel to this match to where we were at 10 minutes ago when uh, Tommy Paul was up a break with 4-3. But now it's Tommy Paul serving to stay in this set, so things could get very interesting. Yeah, they certainly could. Um, I think, yeah, yeah. I mean, Tommy Paul had to have been feeling a little bit nervous, two holes away from 
his first ever major semifinal. He'd never been in, never been past the fourth round, I think. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Oh, and it seems like he was 30 love up in that game that he got broken. 4 3 30 love. Oh, wow. And then and we must have missed four... quite a bit. Yeah, we were just we were just talking. I didn't see anything in that game because no, I was I was missing Alcaraz so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we're deep we're deep in an Alcaraz discussion. Uh, those of you just tuning in, make sure you hit the like button, whether that be on YouTube, Facebook, um, or elsewhere. And um, if you are watching on YouTube, uh, subscribe to the channel if you're new. I mean, things are really interesting now. I mean, listen, yeah, just one one break of serve here and. Um, Ben Shelton wins the set, and um, yeah, who knows? What, what, what do we think about Shelton physically? Um, pretty good, no? Yeah, I mean, he's he's held up pretty well this this tournament, um, and, I, and I think actually winning this set might give him some new life um, in this match, just because the adrenaline might just take over. I, don't, I haven't seen any signs of him like cramping or physically struggling yet so far. So seems to be holding up. Ghibli suggests that, that Tommy, when he was broken, was a bit anxious. Um, obviously, seeing yeah. the finish line so close. Well, now the finish line seems a bit further away, but but things can change very quickly, especially if he holds here. 15 love, Tommy Paul serving at 5-6. Forehand, Shelton. Backhand, lofted up high, but I don't think it's even going to land in. No, it's not. So it's 30 love for Tommy Paul. Yeah, I mean, things can change again in a minute. He could be three love up in the tie break, four love up in the tie break, and we're having a very different conversation once again. Ah, oh, this is, a, is, it, is the ball boy going to catch it? Ah, the ball keep calling it. Nice. <laughs> okay, here we go. What happened? There was somebody who was saying something to me earlier about Stefano Sitsipas and a ball kid. I don't know if he ran into a ball kid today or something. but um... Oh, I think what happened is he was he was a bit angry <laughs> oh. in, the, oh. in, in the third set, and he actually just, like, whacked the ball against the, the sideboard or okay like in, in the corner and the the ball kid was pretty close actually so oh I if see. He's not, if he's not careful i mean he might have been defaulted yeah right uh okay yeah, i didn't see that um although i was watching the match and commentating on it but uh okay yeah i think i saw a clip of it on twitter someone put it but it was of course he did something similar at wimbledon last year against nick kyrgios yeah that's um, right but uh, I think Kyrgios was asking for him to be defaulted. Right. Or he said something like, if that was me, I'd be defaulted. I think that's what he said. Okay, 30-15 here. Tommy Paul on the backhand. Backhand slice from Shelton. Pretty good depth on that one. And Tommy Paul goes long. 30 all. Good depth there from Shelton on the slice. And I think it, it sort of kind of uh, caused Tommy Paul to err. Uh, and we're at 30 all. So right now, as we speak, Shelton is two points away from winning this set. And Shelton has only broken once in the match so far, a couple of games ago, when, when Tommy Paul had an advantage. Um, but he could well get a second break of serve in, in a relatively short space of time. Okay. Tommy Paul, where are you going with this serve? You are going down the tee. It's a pretty good serve. Oh, it must have probably clipped the next. I don't think it did go out. Unless um, my eyes deceive me. Where are you going with this one, Tommy? To the backhand of Shelton. Shelton, good good shot, that one there. Now on the backhand for Shelton. Forehand, Tommy Paul. Backhand to forehand exchange. This is the, the left and right handers now. But now on the forehand of Shelton. This is turning into a pretty significant rally at 30 all. Backhand slice from Shelton. Decent depth on that one. Wow, that's the longest rally we've had in this match. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm I'm in the midst of it right now. Some nice slices or reasonable slices from Shelton, um, but maybe the last one wasn't quite good enough. And uh, yeah, how many shots was that? Oh, 25. 25. We yeah, we certainly didn't have any many epic rallies in the first set. Yeah. You know, this is exactly the kind of match, though, that... You know, it doesn't look awesome on TV, but when you're actually watching live, it's amazing. Okay. Maybe because like you can see just how hard they're hitting the ball. Yeah, hatching off mood semi-final. Maybe last right. year when, uh, at um, the US Open, I was there live for that, and I thought it was quite exciting. But probably a lot of people watching at home less. So went to four sets exactly. as well. 
And Tommy Paul goes long. So we're now at deuce. That 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 hatching off rude match, by the way, had about a 50, a 50, 50 plus shot rally, I think. I think it was on set yeah, point. Yeah, on the set point. Right? Yeah, that's right. Deuce. Okay, where are you going with this one? Tommy, you are going wide, but it's a fault. Two hours 27 on the clock, mind you. It's been fairly lengthy. I mean, some five setters go, go less than three hours. Okay, and now we have a break point for Shelton. Set point. Set point, yeah, of course, set point. I think I've got a poll still running actually on on YouTube to see uh, who think who thinks going to win the match. Let me see. Um, uh, probably had a bit bit too long really to vote on this one, but still uh, it was fifty two forty eight um, in terms of percentage for this one. Um, hmm, much closer than I would imagine. Well, okay, uh, Tommy Paul on the forehand now. Both players on the forehand actually. It's Tommy Paul on the backhand. He goes long. It's it's done. Ben Shelton. <laughs> Wow. I'm certainly not going to the gym and um, we're into a fourth set. How are you feeling any energy wise, Vance? Are you okay for a fourth set? I definitely am. Yeah. I was, uh, you know, obviously starting to feel a little bit tired usually, yeah. but uh, this is, this is a good, an exciting now. It yeah. It was just 4 3 30 love. And we were talking about how Alcaraz would have made the <laughs> yeah. there. And the next thing you know, we're going to a fourth set. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, if this goes five, uh, that would yeah, be that another... Might, that might be a bit too much, but we'll see. Yeah, okay. But I'm also thinking it might be a bit too much for one player or the other if they were to go through at the semi-final and play Novak. Um, Tommy Paul, I remember him having back-to-back -back five setters in New York last year, and I think it, he may well have paid the price in his third-round match. And I remember this tournament, he had Davidovich for Kina five sets, but the other matches were all less than five. And I thought... Um, I thought, okay, that should help him a bit. And that may may explain why he's having a decent run here rather than going out any earlier than this stage. But uh, yeah, let's see what's going on here. Um, ben here, uh, Ben Shelton showing his inner Andy. Yeah, I was, by the way, back to Andy as well. Um, I was thinking to myself that um, that match with RBA, I think he lost 12 of the first 13 points. And yeah. I think he did lose the first set 6-1, maybe. Um, yep. It felt very comfortable for RBA. And, and uh, I think he was a breakdown in the second as well. Um, but somehow he, he got that back on serve and then somehow snatched that set. And you're like, wow. I, just, I mean, he was he was struggling to move at various points throughout the match. But but in the first set and a half as well, he was struggling to move, never mind the, the latter stages. Yeah. And he talked in the press conference about how he couldn't get the extension on the serve because of his lower back. Okay. He, he, his back had been killing him since the Berrettini match, since the the two matches back to back, but more mm. specifically the Kokinakis match mm. and the late finish. And so he pretty much had to kind of arm his serve at 10, 15 miles per hour less than what he was. Okay. Before and still managed to win the set. Indeed. Yeah, but as we said earlier, I think. Uh, 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 I mean, whether he, do you think he'll play the clay court season? I don't know. He might. He, he has taken. I think he's. I think he said he was going to take the clay court season off either last year or the year before, and then he ended up playing it. Yeah, he ended up playing Madrid, I think, and then didn't play any of the other. Yeah, uh, Ghibli. They're reiterating the fact that he thought that Tommy got nervous in the serve game to consolidate his break, which is understandable. Yep, four three finish line in sight. I need to yeah. change my banner here, of course. Okay, 15 all on the Ben Shelton serve. Um, things certainly look very, very interesting now compared to... So basically, Tommy Paul, I don't know how many service games in a row he held, but it probably was around about the 12 mark, maybe even more, maybe maybe something like 14, 15 service games in a row he held. And now he's been broken twice in three games, I'm going to say. Yep. 
So yeah, different different times, different different complexion right now on this match. But an early break for Tommy Paul, and suddenly uh, we're talking differently. It's 15.30 on the Ben Shelton serve, so there's a tiny amount of pressure, albeit we're right at the beginning of this fourth set. Goes wide on his first serve. Where are you going with this one, Ben? You go long, so it's a double fault, and it's two break points for Tommy Paul. I wonder what the break point conversion is like, because it does feel as though Shelton's had to save quite a few break points. Yeah, have I'll, I'll have a look at the after this game. Okay, yeah. Fifteen forty, Shelton to serve. I feel as though we've had fifteen forty a few times on a Shelton serve, but it might not be that many. Into the net, second serve here for Tommy Paul to look at. Shelton gets this one in backhand side. For both players, that's a decent backhand from, from Tommy Paul. Forehand, does that clip the line? I think it must have done. They're still very much in the rally here, but Shelton does well. Good depth there from Tommy Paul, and it's enough to force the error from Ben Shelton as he strikes the ball into the net. Um, again on the backhand side, I believe, and it's one game to love Tommy Paul. So the uh, Tommy Paul right now must be thinking, oh, Deary me, I really should have this match. I should be in the in the locker room by now because he was leading 4-3 with a break in that third set. Anyway, one game to love up in the fourth set. So things yeah. looking much better for him right now. Yeah, and he's converted three out of 13 break points in this match. There Tommy Paul is two for four. So, Sorry, it's the other way around. I mean, Shelton yeah. is two for four in break points and Tommy yeah. is three for 13. Which yeah, feels right. Um, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, when you said two for four, I was a bit surprised with um, that. Yeah, but yeah, so so three from 13. Yeah, it does feel, I just feel as though we've had 15-40 on the Shelton serve a few times in this match. And on that occasion, Tommy Paul converted and he leads one game to love. Goes down the tee with his serve there. Yeah. Novak and uh, Rublev should start on time if this finishes in four sets. They're due to start in an hour and a half from now, so... Uh, if this, whatever happens really in this set, um, they should probably still start on time. But if it does go five, there'll be a slight delay to that match. Have you spoken in any way, shape or form to um, to Owen since he went to Australia? I spoke to him actually just before he left, but I haven't had the chance uh, with the time difference so far. Um, but I'm thinking of speaking to him actually before the final some point this weekend. It's, I did uh, send him a WhatsApp. I think it might have been yesterday or it could have been the day before. Uh, I, I don't know how much of the action he's been catching inside the I think he might have been there for the first couple of days. Did he, did he, what match was he getting very excited over? I just can't remember now. Um, but yeah, um, yeah I, I think haven't really seen, seen much. I think he'd seen at least one, if not both of the Murray matches. Oh, okay. Murray wins, and then, because I know he met up with Claire as well. Oh, okay, I've cool. Never watched it all. Yeah. Mm. Is it the first? Yeah, time I, I think I think he might have also been in the stadium for Rune versus Rublev. Maybe. Mm. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So yeah, he's yeah. he's very much still there then. Ah, uh, is he going any more? Do you know this week? I think he has tickets for the semis, as far okay. as I know. So he'll. Probably be there for. Oh, cool. Djokovic versus Tommy Paul if Tommy Paul keeps holding. <laughs> yeah. Funny enough, uh, it feels like Novak is closer to the finish line in his match than Tommy Paul does in his, even though Tommy <laughs> Paul is leading two sets to one. Yeah. Also, another thing is kind of funny how Djokovic is playing all these players for the first time this year. He yeah, Dimonor, Tommy Paul potentially, or Shelton, of course. Yeah. So, like Corda, Dimonor, and then. One of these two is going to be new. Yeah. Yeah, I was surprised. I, I thought there was an issue with, with where I was searching for his his head-to-head -head against Dimonor. I mean, how oh, old yeah. is Dimonor? Yeah, Dimonor. I mean, Dimonor is actually not that old. He's, I think he'll be 24 in February, but he's been on the okay. tour for so long, like, you know, five yeah. years. And you would have thought that they would have at least met two or three times, let alone you know, yeah. zero. It's really surprising because they were in the draw. They were like one match away, like two or three times, and this never happened. Yeah. Um, I remember Demon Nor playing Rafa in 2020 at the 
uh, the uh, ATP Cup, RIP ATP Cup. Um, yeah. and, uh, and obviously, funny enough, I actually remember people getting really excited about Divin Nord versus Nadal 2019 uh-huh. at the Australian Open. And that was the year where Nadal just streamrolled it through yeah, the draw and beat everyone until even Stefanos in the semi. Yeah. yeah, just crush Stefanos. Some interesting comments. I, I wish I could remember specifically what he said because probably not, I'm probably going to make them sound less interesting, but. But uh, Stefanos said that the difference between the two Australian Open matches that he had with Rafa in 2019 and 2021 was a case of him learning, learning when to pull the trigger, learning, knowing things about Rafa's game that he hadn't known, talking about the level of experience he had in 2019 of, 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 of just trying to hit winners left, right and centre and, and it just not working. Um and comparing the two Aussie Open matches that were just two years apart, 2019 and 2021. Of course, in 2021, he comes from two sets to love down and wins that one in five. Um, and uh, yeah, just, I mean, he, he did flesh it out with a bit more interesting stuff, but just saying that there was something that, that that just clicked for him that day, if you like, and he just he just realized something and he just knew when to pull the trigger, if you like, uh, in that particular match. And he felt so good about about how to play tennis against Rafa Nadal. I mean, he, he lost the first two sets, 6-3, six, 6-2, six, I'm going to say. So it did look like the match was going the same way as other matches between the two, because I think that's the first time Rafa lost to Steph. It might still be the only time he's lost to him, actually. But um, but they yeah. haven't played much in the I last eight beat him on, I think he beat him on clay in Madrid in 2019. But that was, yeah, Madrid 2019 in the semis. Okay. And also Barcelona 2021 in the final, which was yeah, after. That was, that was that was a really good match. That uh, it was an excellent match. Yeah, it was th- yeah. like three. It was well over three hours that match. Yeah, that was so one of the best setup. matches uh, all year. Nadal had to save a match point. He did. He, he clipped the, he clipped the net on the match point as well. Yeah, <laughs> which I always think just adds to it. You know, yeah, yeah. It was on it was on Rafa's serve. I think it was 30-40. Um, and it was a really good rally. It may have finished with a. With a with a with a volley from Rafa at the net, I'm not sure, but it just finished in a. It was a great rally, but at one point he does clip the net. It, it doesn't yeah. change much in terms of the dynamic of the rally. Uh, it's not like it threw Steph or anything like that. But what it does do is it just goes to show that a um, couple of centimeters, maybe even less, and uh, and Stefanos wins that. Uh, but by the way, Stefanos was still devastated. Uh, Stefanos on the podium for that match. He doesn't do any of the the. Sp- he actually grabs the bottle of champagne and starts to neck it actually. <laughs> yeah. um but uh yeah it was a great match but yeah back back to stefanos um he did feel as though he, he learned something about himself but also about playing rafa that day which i thought was quite interesting and i don't think he's played him on a hard court since uh not since 2021 that's just two years i think they've yeah. i think they've only played each other once since and that was that barcelona final i think yeah, they haven't played since barcelona so that's yeah exactly yeah because I think many of us were, were thinking they might well play each other in Paris at some point. And this was, in my opinion, Stefanos's best form of his career uh, throughout that sort of five or six months from Australia through to Paris. Um, yeah. But uh, but that match never happened uh, because uh, Novak beat Rafa in the semis. Yeah. Here we are, uh, Tommy Paul, a break to the good. Morning, Matthew. Looks like Shelton may be running on fumes. Indeed, that is true, Matthew. But if you have just tuned into the match, there, despite him being a breakdown in the fourth set, it's much better than it was 40-odd minutes ago because uh, Tommy Paul was a breakup in the third, leading 4-3, and therefore just two service holds away from winning the match. But uh, Shelton managed to break and uh, won, the, won the set 7-5. So... Despite, if you just tune in, you're thinking, oh, things don't look good for, for Ben Shelton right here. But they actually, uh, uh, Ben Shelton would have taken this half an hour ago, if you like, a breakdown in the fourth. Yep. And where are we going with this one? Ah, an easy point for Tommy Paul, 40 love. As he errs closer towards, uh, edges closer towards a, um, a 3-1 lead uh, and consolidating this hold that he has already from the first game. Or the first Ben Shelton, yeah, first game, yeah. I'm guessing Matthew's in Europe. I think Matthew might be in in uh, UK. I, I forget where various people are. 
I think Ghibli is, is from the UK, but he's actually skiing somewhere um, in the Alps. Are you a skier, Vanch? I've gone a couple of times, actually. We have we have this mountain nearby, and um, it's called Big Bear Lake. It's like okay. two and a half hour drive from where I'm at in San Diego. I've tried it a couple of times. You even took lessons once, but I haven't actually gone back and done it since. I'm a little bit scared that I might injure myself and won't be able to play tennis. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, I can just see that Ghibli and Matthew are acquainting themselves both with themselves, but also with this match. Um, yeah, Shelton serving one three forehand return from uh Tommy Paul. Does Tommy Paul excite you as a tennis player? And if not, or if so, why? Um, I think he's. I certainly enjoy his style of play. He's got he takes the ball early. He has good hands. He uh, I, I enjoyed him for instance when he played Alcaraz in uh, Canada. Ended up winning mm -hmm. and saved match point. Mm -hmm. Played a good match against Rude. I think there's certain matchups where I I really enjoy watching him play. And he's got you know he's really got all, all this talent and he's really athletic and it's just a matter of him choosing the right points to uh, you know attack like it's just you know waiting being a little bit more patient but i like where his game is headed he seems to have gotten consistently better because he made the fourth round of wimbledon i think with boston nori there and then u.s open he came really close against rude and he had those five setters against uh, i think zapata morales in the first round and then corda in the second yeah and then he was just completely gassed and probably should have won that third set against rude they would have been up two sets to one. Yeah. Um, and then obviously had the run in Paris Mercy. So yeah. he's been he's been slowly kind of building up more consistent week after week and getting himself in the top 30. But I, I, I certainly don't put him ahead of like, let's say Tiafo. I think Tiafo is like showtime. Yeah. In terms of like entertainment value. Right. And Tiafo, my goodness me, six one up in that tiebreaker against Hatchinoff. And by the way, that match against Hatchinoff, I think was the first two sets went the way of the Russian, and yeah. um, and then he then he certainly catches fire in the third set, and and to, to some extent the fourth set. And I was really looking forward to a fifth set in that match. So um, I was particularly disappointed when he when he threw that way. And I tell you what, it's something I want to speak to you about, Vance. Something I said, I think either during commentary or in a review later on that day, which was that. I've seen so many tiebreakers where one player or the other takes a huge lead. Uh, when I say huge, I'm thinking four point advantage. If you like, in a, in a normal tiebreak to seven, we've got a break point for Tommy Paul here at thirty yeah. forty. I'll come back to the tiebreak drama of Tiafo in a second. Um, a little bit of communication with his team, which of course these days is is allowed, at least for now. Uh, Thirty forty, Ben Shelton serving, facing a break point and a potential double break. It's an ace. It's an ace. I saw someone in his team do that, like do a yeah. tease, telling so, him where to serve. Yeah, where to where to? Yeah, oh, was it someone in his? Yeah, so he's telling him where to serve exactly, but he went the other way. <laughs> My concern with that is I won't. Wasn't wasn't going to be sure if Tommy Paul was going to catch out the corner of his eye. There may have been an exchange between the two players on the topic because they're both laughing about something. Anyway, juice. Yeah. So the 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 um. Oh, this is turning into a decent rally as well. Uh, where are we going to go with this one? Both hitting the ball pretty hard, but but fairly centrally and and fairly conservatively, although. Ben Shelton changes it up a bit now, and he wins the point with a winner down the line. Uh, so game point now, Ben Shelton. Yeah, the the, the tie-break conundrum, if you like. You go up a four-point advantage, and I'm thinking 6-2 or five-point advantage like Tiafo had 6-1. What happens next? So you've obviously got four or five set points, and I'm thinking of a few tie-breakers such as Rafa against Novak. I think he had 6-2 at the uh french open quarterfinal last year yeah, I'm six thinking, one and then six one, six to six one was four, and then exactly yeah i know it got back to six four so so six one to six four you've also got zverev against uh rafa which i think was six two um yeah. as well uh, to zverev's good on this occasion and then this one as well which was six one to uh Tiafas. shelton holds by the way so it's 
just the one break of serve down at the moment for him. Now, I know they all had three different results, if you like, um, and three uh, different situations. But what I want to highlight is the 6-4 point. Because for me, psychologically, you have, you've got this unbelievable advantage you've managed to manufacture for yourself where you've now got four set points, four match points, whatever, uh, maybe five in Tiafo's case. Where what happens is you lo you lo you win or lose the first one. Of course, if you win it, you won the set or the match, and 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 it's great. But even if you lose it, no need to be too anxious. You've still got three the insurance of three or four more points. You then lose two in a row. So let's say it's six two to six four or six one to six three. Then I think you're thinking, especially to six two to six four. You're then thinking, I've got no more. I got I don't have that insurance anymore. I don't have that relaxation zone or period that I what that level of comfort that I could have had despite the fact that you still got one more set point or match point you don't have that anymore if you lose that because boy you you start to feel anxious and you're thinking oh my goodness if I lose if I go six four to six five then suddenly it's like oh, oh, oh my god I've lost all those chances now and and I'm I'm in trouble and I think once Tiafo goes from six four to six five in that in that tie break I just thought he's not winning this there's no way he's winning this. He did well to to make it go on, if you like, to I think about I think 10 8, I think it was in the end, to Hatchin off. But um yeah, I just thought, yeah, that's 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 a that's a real crucial moment. Because I know you've still got six five and therefore you've still got a, a set or a match point, but because you've lost so much momentum and now you're feeling anxious, it's like it's almost like you've got your break advantage. Let's say you're five one up, it then goes back to five three. And then on serve, you're trying to serve it out for the second time and you go down love 30 and you're thinking, oh, no, you know, I've, I've already had one breakup. I'm all I've already had a double breakup. And and then suddenly the 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 end is no longer in sight. It's now, oh, my goodness me, I've got to get this back. Exactly. Yeah. This, the tennis system scoring system is just evil genius. You know, the way it, oh, it is. Works. It is. You, you've got no breathing room whatsoever in any situation. Uh, on the odd occasion, I don't mind it being tampered with a bit, i.e., in doubles, for example, in the in the in the indoor season, and, and maybe elsewhere. And, and I don't mind playing around with things a little bit, exhibitions, mm. all the rest of it. But but yeah. for the major tour, well, for basically any serious tournament, I want it to stay exactly the same: three sets, you know, mm. and uh, advantage, and and all the rest of it. Uh, I know that Craig O'Shaughnessy, in particular, is a big a big fan of. Shake and and Moritoglu as well, aren't they? They're they're sort of trying to to shake things up a bit on the scoring side. I don't know how you feel about some of those notions. Yeah, I think it's good to to do it in exhibitions. You know, just mess around with it a little bit. Like I I like how they do it in Milan, where it's like yeah. the three. You know, you know, like I don't mind that, but I I would mind it if it became on a main thing on the tour and it decided big matches and outcomes. I wouldn't want no ad scoring, for example, to decide. No. Some of the best matches, and you know, I mean, the, the physicality and the uh, like, mental toughness, and all of that are like really big components. And then you're gonna add in probably a lot more luck into the into the game when you you know change the scoring format like that. And exactly, I mean, just some of the classic games that we've we've seen, where, yeah. uh, for example, I'm thinking of of uh, Andy against Roger at Wimbledon. I think it's a 20 minute game that they have, uh, yeah. with just you know, I love it. With you, well, there's a net cord there, but it doesn't halt Tommy Paul from winning the point. You know, just just you know, you can win three points in a row, but if you win it, win it at a at a less important moment, if you like, then it, it's not. It's not that significant. It's just kind of funny that that if you'd won, if you you may win a certain amount of points, but if you don't win them at the right moment, uh, you know you can win back to back points, which from deuce you win the match, you win the game, and potentially the match if it's if it's the last game. You can win back to back points if you're advantage down, and you've still got another one to go. You know. Yeah, it's also a little bit anticlimactic, like winning the point in deuce, and then all of a sudden you're up a break, and yeah. it's like what. Yeah. 15 all here on the Shelton serve. Uh, uh, Tommy Paul won his service game fairly comfortably. What, uh, what do you think about nets? I've heard people say, oh, we should get rid of them. I don't know about uh, that. Like it's No, I'm I'm fine. There's there's all sorts of things in tennis that I would like to tweak with, if you like. And I don't think they're dramatic 
uh, necessarily. And I'm, I'm, but I'm, most of the things in terms of the rules of the game, I don't see much I want to change, to be honest with you. Yeah. I wasn't that. I, I, I get it with the toilet breaks and all the rest of it they were talking about about 18 months ago. I'm not that keen on on-court coaching either, but it yeah. hasn't changed the spectacle too much for me uh, in the last sort of six months or so. But I would probably rather not have that. And in terms of your let's question, no, I'm fine with it. It, it. it would become an issue in my, it only becomes an issue if you were getting loads in a, in a game and it was just like getting, but it's such a unique moment. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's very rare. Like it's not exactly. something that happens very Which often. is why if it happens twice in a row, it's like, or if three times off a serve, for example, because yeah. that's obviously what you're talking about. You're saying that you, you clip the net and you lose a serve. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, basically, it's 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 a fault if you if you clip the net, whether it lands in or not. But it's so rare that it's kind of funny. Funny enough, I was or, playing. No, no. Actually, what I'm saying is that you play the lets. So if it, you know, if it oh. tips the net and it goes over, then you have you have to be ready for it as a returner. Oh, okay. So no, like, you, know, like you can hit harsh. an ace. You can hit an ace with the let. You know. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's, that's what listen. I mean. I, I, I'm, you know, it happens, of course, from time to time in terms of uh, in terms of the rally, etc. And it's one of those unfortunate things. Of course, Holger Runa, yeah. unfortunately, uh, struggled with it. Of course, the other day, but um, but uh, no, no, I, I hadn't heard that one before actually. And and uh, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> that would be harsh. That yeah. would be super harsh. Yeah, for sure. No, I, I like it still... the way it is. I, I I really don't want to mess with like the genius of the scoring system, to be honest. No, it's... is there is there anything else though in terms of the rules that you would that you would in terms of the rules of the, of the I talked about thinning the calendar, but if we just focus on the the rules of the game, if you like, is there anything you'd like to alter or think? I mean, about we definitely need like video replay for like incidentals, you know, like for things like a double bounce, for example, or like anything okay. that's like you know that causes a controversy between two players. If you just have the umpire like view that on a screen like through the video and then you, you could just make a call right there and then instead of like because sometimes you don't catch it for a double bounce is there any kind of technology that could could sense that as well just because i'm not sure that always a video replay would be that conclusive or or even or even a, a player doesn't know i sometimes the player do you think the player i mean vance you've played the game to a higher level than me do you, do you i don't think you always know if there's a double bounce I think most of the times you do, but then there's the time, rare yeah. occasion where you're just not sure. Like you know, no. you, you might have you might have got it. Like if what if it uh, it didn't have much spin and you were able to pick it up on one bounce? It's it's quite likely actually. It's not um, it's not always super obvious actually when you're in the moment. Colby here asking who we think is going to win. Colby, nice to have you on board. Uh, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Okay, so this is interesting actually because Paul is in the same position he was in. In the third set, and now he's going to Indeed, have... he is. Yeah. So, Col Colby, in answer to your question, Shelton looks like he's in a in a in a spot of bother. In fact, in a big spot of bother. Tommy Paul is um, up a break in the fourth set. But as as you said, Vanch, this time half an hour ago, forty minutes ago, we were pretty convinced Tommy. Or I was convinced that Tommy Paul would win this in straight sets. But he's in exactly the same position. He's two games away from winning. I wonder if that's going through his mind right now. Maybe it is. Uh, he's 15 love up to the good. So let's see if he can at least win this service game. But yeah, I think that's a good point with the double bounce. Um, but that's 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 a, a good addition. I'm not um, but it's not a it's not a dramatic rule change, but I, I yeah. do like it. Are there any other video technology moments that, that could that where that could be relevant? Um maybe like for hindrances or like for like if uh, if it hit if a ball hit didn't touch the racket and it hit you made contact with your body first yeah like wasn't there that video of um Allison risk and the and that doubles match i don't know if you oh, saw that yeah i remember it happening and i remember the controversy as as tommy paul goes 40 love up um i do oh, remember the 40 love up. this is a good cushion last time he lost four yeah. points in a row from three. indeed yeah i do remember the controversy but you're gonna have to refresh my memory on that one yeah, I think so. I actually I'm not super well versed in this, but I like saw a short video about it. But like, um, I think as the opponent was making contact at the net and putting away a volley, it actually hit 
and 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 actually, so so she she, she kind of shouted or like you know screamed like whoa like in the middle of the point, but that was because it actually hit the opponent, in the it, it hit the opponent in the chest, and mm-hmm. she didn't get it with the racket, at net. So, you know, she he, he the umpire called risk for hindrance, when in reality she was just reacting to the point that it already finished essentially, yeah. and and then the umpire didn't even see it. The umpire didn't see that it hit, that it made contact with the body before it hit the racket. Yeah. So that, uh, yeah. And then they had like a funny little exchange about it, and the supervisor was called. Matthew here in the chat suggesting that he thinks that Tommy Paul could do something versus Novak. Uh, the confidence of being Rafa and Alcaraz uh, last year, maybe. Uh, he also watched Tommy Paul defeat Paris, uh, PCB at the Paris Masters, and when he's hot, he's hot. Um, yeah, quite possibly. Yeah, I can I can certainly see um, Tommy playing a really tight set, if not maybe even winning one. He's uh, yeah. he's got the tools. He certainly has the variety, that's for sure. And he's certainly got uh, got the baseline consistency. Now, I mean, he's beaten RBA, which is a very good win, four sets mm-hmm. coming off the Murray match, and then he's it got a, you know, there's a somebody beat in straight sets as well during this run. Oh, that's yeah, good. Brooksby, which was Brooksby, that was uh, a really good. Good win. Although I did hear the books may have been struggling physically a bit in that match. I'm not sure how true that was. Yeah, I think in just recovering from that emotional high of the big upset. Yeah, Casper, and then yeah, and then the the Davidovich Fakina is the most physical match that he had this tournament, where he was two sets to one down and came yes. back. The, I think had a very tough first round against Struff as well. He never want to play Struff in the first round. Yeah, I think that was a tough first round for him to draw anyway, because I think Struff was looking pretty good in qualifying. So um, yeah. Shelton here on serve and is uh, 30 15 up. And he now turns it into 40 15. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, I I might have. I'm just trying to remember my bracket. I might have had Struff winning that. I just, I can't remember now. I think I, I'm sure I probably did because I remember thinking that Struff would, would have a half decent tournament just on the back of, of how well he did in qualifying. Yeah. So I two game I points had, here for Ben Shelton. I think I had Tommy in my quarters. Oh. oh no no I didn't actually I had him losing to Casper Rood. Huh. I can't remember where I had Casper Rood going out. It might have been the quarterfinals actually, but um, yeah. I certainly didn't. I, I was thinking that Casper Rood would get that far because I thought the draw was okay for him, but I should have really taken um, Brooksby more seriously. But um, I hovered over that for so long, John. Like I I picked Brooksby initially. I I really did, and I ran okay. away with it, and I had. Uh, I had Casper losing in the second round, and then I changed it to Casper. And then I thought, no, 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 no. You know what? Brooksby can do it. And then I changed it to Brooksby. And then I was like, wait, but best of five. Like, can you really do it for three sets? And then I went back to Casper. <laughs> I just couldn't decide. <laughs> yeah, the um, the thing is with Casper. I mean, we touched upon it earlier in terms of his preparation, but also his form, uh, yeah. and also the just the belief that. That uh, for me in Paris, for example, last year, he did have a, I think, Tsitsipas, who was not in great form at the time, but also going out. You know, you play Marin Cilic in the semifinals for the first, for your, on, on, a, on clay for a chance to win, to get to the final of your first slam. I just thought that um, one yeah, of the Yeah, there were no top 10 players that he beat in route to either no. slam final, that's for sure. And, and also playing Cilic on, on clay is, is slightly different to other surfaces. So, yeah. So yeah, I just thought that that perhaps oh, it was the right idea from Ben Shelton, but he I I think he went the right way with that, but he just didn't execute mm. it at all the yeah. right way. So the now, yeah, way match too point. Much. Just needed to too much. Too, sorry, yeah, Vance, you're absolutely right. Uh, too much racket face on that. It just needed a bit bit less racket face and a bit more dinky. Uh, anyway, uh, match point. Tommy Paul returning. To be fair, under pressure on break points and stuff, he's done pretty well on the surf. So, but this, yeah. oh, he does well that time as well. Uh, into the body he goes. Oh, and, wow, that's uh, a good it, surf. Yeah, he's usually Able. gone uh, wide on that on that one and saved a few few of them. But this time he really changed it up. Yeah, went to the body. Juice. This guy's a great and competitor. It, yeah, another one returnable. I like the way he's just like dug in and competed in this match, even though he's could have easily lost this six four in the third. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
Oh, that back to Juice play. again. So Tommy Paul again is within a couple of points of victory. See how this one pans out. Where are you going to go with your serve this time? Goes down the T, but I think it's long. Just over three hours now. Into the forehand of Tommy Paul. Forehand Ben Shelton. I thought he was going to hit the net again there for a second. Shelton goes quite big. And quite big was good enough. Advantage Shelton. Wow, yeah. He still could have gone bigger on that forehand, but but it was one of those where where being quite aggressive was was good enough. Yeah, um, absolutely. And he hit it with enough firepower, but to a really big target. He didn't really yeah, go too exactly. close to the line, which is the yeah. right play. Ah, and he's won the game because uh, he's gone into the body again. I hope. Uh, oh, I hope uh, Tommy Paul's all right there because he. <laughs> gingerly got to his feet he uh, he went down for one of those ones that you go into the body where you decide to try and do that and he sort of just gingerly got back up to his feet and and uh not quite a limp but um just went back to his seat uh but he's yeah. not taking any treatment um looks he's like really he's reminding might... me of like a he's... like a hybrid of like a shuffle ball over a draper almost yeah <laughs> you know with the swashbuckling type style i really like his he has such a lively arm yeah, but do you see how he just sort of went down as he went down to do that that return, Tommy? Paul. Yeah, he had to really duck. He almost yeah, got and he hit just in the chest. Might have tweaked something in his foot. Oh, I um, hope not. I didn't. I didn't actually catch that. Yeah, uh, um, I, I'm optimistically saying it's nothing too serious because I think if it was an immediate moment of pain, I think given that I want to yeah. change over right now, he might be um, calling for some treatment. But um. But look, he just just doesn't look. He's not comfortable walking back to his seat there. Oh wow! Um, but it's it. I think he's alright. It might just be one of those. Yeah, he, he looks. This is the crucial sort of bit when you take those first next few steps, and you're. It's something that it's on your mind for the next sort of five minutes, and then suddenly it's no longer there, and then twenty minutes later you're thinking, oh, I forgot all about that. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. uh, fingers crossed, he's okay. Five four serving for the match, Tommy Paul. You just don't know all the time with those things. It's a bit like you don't always know until the next morning, <laughs> until, yeah. till how, especially with the adrenaline. Anyway, 15 love. Good first serve there for Tommy Paul. I think it's, listen, uh, um, irrespective of my feelings about Novak, um, you know, a, a Tommy Paul, Stefanos Tsitsipas final, I think could be quite interesting. Yeah. Nothing against Karen Hatchinov. I just just probably find Stefanos a bit more exciting as a player. Second serve here, backhand yeah, return. I, think would, I, I would agree. I think that would be the most maybe lackluster final, Hatchinov versus Djokovic. Yeah, yeah, for a variety of reasons. Um, but yeah. yeah. And nothing against Hatchinov. It's just the way the Yeah, Hatchinov, I like He seems a nice guy. And, and that yeah. style of tennis and, and style of play may well end up um, bearing big fruit still as he goes on in his career. Um, but, uh, yeah, a Novak, uh, Hatchinoff final, even a Rublev Hatchinoff final. I'm not sure I'd be too excited by. Yeah. Hatchinoff is 0-22 against top 10 players since August, 2019. <laughs> so he's on quite a losing quite a run. Here. Yeah. I mean that, as I was saying, that brand of tennis and that style, uh, I, I was struggling to convince myself that that could bear fruit in, in a big way, if you like. Uh, yeah. I can see him winning 250s and 500s like that, but I would I, I would struggle to see him winning a Grand Slam in that fashion. Well, that's yeah, excellent. He seems to really turn it on in the slams. I mean, quarterfinals are better now at all four. And... Yeah, you can get a good yeah. run like he had in New York, and you can maybe yeah. get a bit fortunate. I mean, he's obviously not played ten player, t top 10 players during either of these two runs, at least until yeah. the semis. And that explains why he got that far. By the way, we've got two match points now, at least on my screen, for yep. Tommy Paul. 40-15, he leads. Where are you going with your serve, Tommy? You are going out wide to the backhand of Shelton. And Shelton goes long to the relief and joy of Tommy Paul. He wins uh, in four sets, 7-6, six, 6-3, six, 
5764 made a bit of heavy weather weather of it because for those of you that don't know he was fourthly up uh in the um uh, third set with a break so he was very much in control of the match but hats off to Ben Shelton for breaking back and then going on to win that set uh Ben Shelton will have better days that is for sure it won't be the last time we see him deep in a grand slam I'm pretty confident of that so look forward to plenty 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 more of Ben Shelton at the age of just 20 but on the day, Tommy Paul, better player, right, Vanch? Yep, he was just a little bit more steady. Obviously, used his experience well um, in big moments. Uh, played a very, very solid fourth set. Really didn't give much away. And in general, he was, yeah, he was he, he was just better. Um, particularly in the rallies, he didn't miss as early. Um, Shelton sometimes tried to pull the trigger a bit too soon. But I think he'll learn that with... Uh, with you know, he'll improve his shot tolerance certainly as his career goes on, goes along. And there's so much to like about this guy. He's only 20 years of age, and he's th this was an unbelievable run for someone who's never left the U.S. to go on a run like this, first time ever outside of the country, and you know, becoming so close to to a you know semifinal yeah. finish. Like it was it was remarkable. You know, if yeah. he wins that first set, you know, you never know. It's... Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and if he doesn't, I mean, it's all ifs and buts. And if he doesn't go break down in that, uh, by the way, he gives a handshake to uh, um, oh goodness me, the di tournament director, the South African guy of, of Australian. Oh, Open, Craig Tiley. Name? Craig Tiley. Yeah, they just yeah, they just yeah. had a sort of a handshake as as they as um Ben went off court. I don't uh, maybe that's a frequent thing. But listen, he yeah, you're right. He I'm just comes for the wild card, probably. No, I'm kidding. I don't know. Oh yeah, it could be yeah. <laughs> I actually, I actually did, either didn't realize or I'd forgotten that he got a wild card for this tournament. Um, but listen, yeah, maybe thanking him for that. But I, I'm sure he won't need many more wild cards because, listen, yeah. I think we're going to be seeing him going deeper at, at hard court slams in particular. Anyway, um, probably for the for the next decade or so. So um, we'll yeah. be seeing uh, Ben Shelton again soon. But today is the day of Tommy Paul. He's into his first Grand Slam semi final. Uh, I do think that there have been signs that this has been coming. I didn't see Hatchinoff making a, a Grand Slam semifinal in New York, and I didn't see it happening again here, to be honest with you. But I do think there have been some clues with Tommy Paul over the last six months. Um, yeah. A bit like, in a way, a bit of a sort of a Borna Chorich scenario in that there maybe have been... Uh, it hasn't happened for Chorich since Cincinnati. But... Um, but I just feel that both of those players are dropped the odd clue that they have got a, a semi-final at a Grand Slam in them somewhere pretty soon, uh, on the hard courts anyway. And and who knows, maybe Chorich's time will come in, in New York uh, later on this year. But uh, yeah, Tommy Paul, over the last six months, I, I was fortunate enough to be there in the stadium when he beat uh, Rafa in Paris uh, in um, October, I'm going to say, end of October. And uh, yeah, I'm really pleased for him because he's, he's a decent guy. Yeah, I like watching him. He's obviously got a tremendous amount of talent, athleticism, and he's putting it all together. And you, you know, you want to see that in a player who has that kind of that kind of game. And the clues have been there all the way since the start of last year. I mean, he beat Zverev at Indian Wells, and that was a very good match in a third set tiebreak. And he, before that, he won he won his first title in Stockholm, and he beat so many good players there. I remember. Um, and. Uh, since then, he's really gotten better, even in the majors. And like we were discussing, he was very close to beating Casper Ruud at the U.S. Open as well. Yeah. And he's starting to put it together for a consistent, longer period of time without losing his focus. Just like Tiafo, actually, at the U.S. Open. He's yeah. starting to, you know, both these guys are starting to be a little bit more disciplined. And I think that discipline, along with that combination of, uh, you know, still not losing what makes them so appealing as players, which is their, you know, finesse and their entertainment value and their the way they play the tennis it's easier on the eye uh, than yeah. some some of the americans that's what i really like about this new generation of americans actually including ben shelton and several of them the ones in the top 10 um i mean not top 10 top 50 i should say uh top 10 in america i guess but they're all they've all got really fascinating game styles and they're all very aggressive but they're also extremely patient they all have great backhands they're all good decent movers we're out of that sort of johnson Isner, query type, big serve, big forehand mold. I think yeah. Got yeah, into more complete games with all the, with all these guys. I mean, yeah, they're all very interesting. Like Brooksby is very interesting in his, in his own way, very unorthodox, mm -hmm. very, you know, sort of reminds you of a club player, but then you watch him play and you realize there's so much more to it than that. And um, yeah, it's just nice to see it all come, nice to see it all happen. 
Yeah, that's a good point, actually. I mean, I'm, uh, I grew up with, with uh, Sam Prass and um, who else? Andy Roddick, of course, after that. And then obviously more recently with Opelka and Isna. Uh, of course, Sam Prass had a lot more to his game than, than, than Opelka and Isna. But I, I hope you, you get the sentiment there. But these guys are, are very different uh, types of player. Um, uh, they've got Some of them have got a little bit of Sam Prass. Some of them have got a little bit of Agassi. Again, I'm not saying they are on that level, but, uh, but they are. much. It's a much more interesting breed, you're right. Yeah. And I think they're gonna have they're gonna push each other. They're gonna continue to get better. I think Fritz is gonna be very hungry after this. There's no way he should be losing so early in two hard court slams in a row. That's a big. I mean, I know Alexi Popperin was playing very good tennis, but uh, he shouldn't be losing that match as a top eight seed. No way. No, he shouldn't. No. Um. Uh. Yeah, he shouldn't be at all. And that's probably the only sort of um. You know. Uh. Negative really moment in terms of this tournament for for most American players. Listen, at least on the men's side. Uh. Thanks very much for stopping by, Vanch, to, uh, today and or this evening, as I should say, is where you are in California. Yep. It was it was great. Uh. Look look forward to it, and uh, hopefully we can do this again soon. Great. Thanks, Vanch. And uh, Vanch can now uh, sail off into the. I was going to say the sunset, but of course, the sun is long since set in uh, California. The sun is just rising here in Central Europe. And I'm going to play us out with this video, which will be on a loop for the next five or ten minutes. So, uh, Vanch, take care. See you soon. Yep. See you, John. And to the rest of you, take care. Mm -hmm.